welcome our graduating students, um, family and friends, uh, and to thank you for all the support you've given our writers over the past couple of years. It's a, it's a very idiosyncratic and challenging profession and um, people really need other people to have their back to be able to do this. So thank you to all of, of you. And we hope that you'll join us for the reception after this afternoon's reading. So as you know, this is the MPW graduate student reading. And just before we begin, I want to announce that the first ever Thai American writers reading is being held under the auspices of MPW in Penn West this summer here on campus. And we have these postcards in the back if you're interested. Um, we have some wonderful um, Thai writers coming, including Prince Gamal Vilas, who teaches on our faculty, and Pomon Triplett, who's just an astonishing poet. Astonishing. So um, keep us in mind for your summer uh, literary event planning. Um, so this, this handout that went around has a quasi-accurate um, lineup. Um, as Joe Peters, one of our students, uh, uh, circled Jackie and, and put an arrow and a question mark. So as Jackie enters, we think she'll be here after Susan Caldwell's reading, and Susan will introduce her. So let me just tell you some things about our program. I'm Bridget Mullins. I'm the director of the program. And this afternoon, our graduating students read from their work. In some instances, they're reading from their thesis manuscript but in some cases not. They will let you know. But all of them are reading from work that they created during their time at MPW. Uh, and, and as you know, um, your, your, your presence here means a lot to us at MPW and a lot to our students. And um, there's a lot of mythology that surrounds the life of a writer, a lot of inherited mythologies. One is that the writer is a solitary animal. It's true that writing takes place alone, unless you're one of the writers who writes in a cafe like Samuel Beckett or Bridget Mullins or other, <laughs> other writers. Um, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is that a writer needs a community and an audience. And that's what MPW is and will continue to be for all of our graduating students. And indeed, earlier today, Dinah Lenny and Ebony and I went to a reception uh, for Ellen Lewis, who's an MPW grad from uh, 98 who just received a really prestigious, hotter fellowship at Princeton to go and work on her work for a year at Princeton. Uh, so, you know, there, there's, and, and she's, she was uh, just a wonderful student and a wonderful presence at MPW. Uh, just to let you know, there's life after MPW. Uh, so today's reading features nine writers, and there will be no intermission in the spirit of a marathon, which, as you know, comes from the Greek practice of running for a long time with endurance, another quality that a writer needs. Um, but before we begin, I need to acknowledge our amazing staff, Ebony Cunningham, Natalie Inoue, and our student team, is Rakina here today? No, but Tom Rastrelli is, who is, uh, they are our student reading series coordinators. Thank you for your help with today's reading. And behind, <laughs> yes, great. And behind the camera, um, is Nicole Perkins, and she will be um, <laughs> trying to catch you in your most embarrassing moments during the reading. Um, so many of our faculty couldn't be here today, but, but many of them could. Among them, Aram Saroyan, sitting in the back row, Janet Fitch, Rita Williams, and Dinah Lenny. So just to acknowledge those guys. <laughs> so, some of our faculty couldn't be here today, and I'm going to kick off the reading by quoting from some of your teachers about your work. So, um, and, and this is in no particular order, so just listen up. Uh, so Amy, we have two poets graduating, three poets actually, two of them are here today. Um, uh, where are you? Our poets, Brian McGacken. Oh, and Jackie's not here yet, that's right. <laughs> Talking about Jackie. So Amy Gersler has this to say about Brian McGacken's Broetry, Poetry for Dudes, which we learned he just got a book deal for. So, um, <laughs> Amy writes that his work is conceptually postmodern, energetic, eloquent, and sincere satiric. 
His poems are not just for dudes, but will captivate anyone who has ever loved, gotten drunk, puzzled over a poem, had their heart broken, admired superheroes, wondered about God, or experienced tenderness or outrage. Brian McGacken has written an inventive, hilarious, smart, romantic, reverent, irreverent concept album disguised as a poetry thesis. <laughs> Nan Cohen writes that Brian McGacken draws upon formal innovation, lyrical sensibility, and sheer wit to infuse his poems with an energy that is both of this moment and of enduring interest. Uh, Gina Nahai writes of Susan Caldwell's work. Gina was Susan's thesis advisor. Uh, Susan is hardworking and focused. She's determined to publish her novel and quite willing to do all the work that's suggested. And I think you'll be reading from your, your novel today. Um, and uh, Gina says, Susan's novel is the story of Sean, a talented and ambitious African-American inner city man, and his earnest attempt at correcting by his own life the mistakes made by his father. Like any good writer, Susan writes from her heart, thinks of her characters as real, cares deeply about what happens to them and how their actions affect others. Uh, of Brad Rochefort, who is my student, uh, I have to say that Brad <laughs> is a writer of incredible, where's Brad? Incredible enthusiasm, wit, and linguistic savvy. He loves the sound of language, but he's also sensitive to the muscle and the action that a text needs. He was a student in my Writers and Their Influences class, and he always stepped up to every occasion, every exercise, every prompt. Brad has a photographer's eye and a poet's ear, which is a great combination for a screenwriter. I understand that Brad is reading from his poetry today, yes? Good, good. And, um, and he's a stunning poet. His concentrating, concentration at MPW was screenwriting, and he studied with Sid Field and finished a full-length screenplay as his project. Um, Danielle Langlais was also in my um, anxiety writer's influence class and also stepped up to every occasion. And M.G. Lord has this to say about Danielle's work. Danielle Langlais' linked essays examine the effect of grief on a young woman struggling to make sense of her father's premature death. They are sometimes funny, often poignant, and consistently brave in their exploration of family love parent-child dynamics, and the terrible chemistry of loss. In Langlais' hands, everyday objects, a New York Yankees baseball cap or a vintage electric guitar, take on greater meaning. They are totems of her father's passions about which she, too, comes to care deeply. Uh, Eric Brock. Uh, Rita, has the, Rita Williams has this to say about Eric. He's such a ruthless writer. Um, and this about your thesis. In this New York summer of endless partying, a grifter descends on these 20-somethings who think they're smart and teaches them what cunning really means. And Judith Freeman wrote um, about Eric, Carlos, and Kelly, so I thought I would read what she wrote. Eric, Carlos, and Kelly, you have to imagine me as Judith Freeman, <laughs> who is one of the most eloquent, refined, and peaceful writers on the planet. So someone completely different from me, um, uh, from Judith. Eric, Carlos, and Kelly were all in my fiction workshop. I wish I could be there today to hear them read from their work. Each has the most wonderfully distinctive voice. I'd like to thank Eric. I'd like to think Eric will design some extraordinary new form of next generation gaming product that will make him fabulously rich, and he can do nothing but devote himself to his fictions, which, as I read them, were plump with the most compelling writing. I'd like to see him have a chance to write a thousand words a day for the rest of his life while living in luxury. <laughs> Carlos, who was in my fiction workshop with Eric and Kelly, has also left his stories permanently etched in my repertoire of memorable student reading. He knows that I think he's a wonderfully gifted writer and also a wonderfully gifted teacher. And because I can't possibly wish Eric a life of luxury without doing the same for Carlos, this is what I hope for him, that he published his first, as it turns out, highly successful memoir while working at a middle school in a beach town in Hawaii, inspiring the hell out of kids and leading a wonderful writer's life. And she has this to say about Kelly. Kelly's writing always surprised me with its inventiveness and energy. 
She has that thing that Raymond Chandler said he valued above all in writing, and in people too, and that is energy. The only question is where she'll put that energy, stories or screenplays. And then you realize you don't care. You just want her to keep writing. And um, I'll wait to read uh, uh, Jackie's if, when, when she comes. But I'll, I'll, I'll close with P.T., who will be our first, our first reader this afternoon. And, and um, Judith has this to say about P.T. I'd like to think P.T. will end up running some literary magazine somewhere. He's got such enthusiasm and taste in fiction, and he loves writing, writers, the writing life, as if it were part of his Bostonian blood. But I think I'd rather see him continue to write his strangely wonderful stories, parts of which are with me now forever. Sly, quiet scenes of tremendous power. That's what I think of when I think of his writing. Please join me in welcoming P.T. McNeil. Well, thank you, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm going to be reading the first chapter from my thesis, which is to be completed over the summer, so this whole thing sort of feels like a sham to me because I'm not done. But that's okay. We'll just move on. Uh, so uh, provisionally, the title for this thesis is called Chat, and uh, this is chapter one. Masturbation used to be so simple. He could vividly remember a time back around age 14 when he could get off on anything. A woman's catalog that arrived in the mail, the glimpse of a bra strap on Ms. Clover, the middle school's hip geography teacher, a particularly alluring smile on the mom in a snuggle commercial. <laughs> they could all prompt him to scramble to the nearest place of privacy. The need to fulfill some type of self-love seemed constant. No heat-generating personal intimacy lubricant required, not even a bottle of Vaseline, just a thought and a tissue. He spent so many random minutes of the day in either his bedroom or his bathroom, his parents must have spent his teenage years concerned that their youngest child had developed a hideous combination of severe narcolepsy and debilitating bowel disorder. <laughs> Ethan shook his head, tapping his thumbs in the six o'clock of the steering wheel. The dancing waves of heat lifted off the road in front of him, obscuring the brown sand and red mountains as if they were innocent bystanders blurred out of amateur news footage. On the side of the freeway, or was he back in the land where they're called highways? Had he crossed into New Mexico yet? How long had he been driving? The occasional abandoned shack reminded him that someone had tried living here before, had tried, failed, and ran screaming, leaving a dilapidated monument behind. The outside temperature reading on his Toyota's dashboard said 114 degrees, and since he never saved the money to fix the air conditioning, inside wasn't that much cooler. The drone of air whipping through the open window at 92 miles per hour drowned out any music, talk, or advertisement on the radio. He hadn't heard the speakers for at least 150 miles, his thumb marking only the memory of a beep. Not that the quick trigger days were necessarily better, of course, just simpler. He flipped on the blinker in the same motion as he yanked his blue hatchback around an overloaded pickup, carting fruit and stacks of wooden boards along with a few scattered chairs in the back. The dusty red truck was the first car he'd passed in, must have been an hour or so. He didn't even think to check the lane before swerving. No one had been in his blind spot since San Bernardino. Was it racist for him to assume a Mexican drove this truck? Probably. Back then, he never needed to work at it. He had no idea what a real kiss felt like, let alone any serious genital-to-genital -genital contact. He hadn't known enough to be bored with the simple hints of arousal. A frumpy-looking white woman in her late 50s appeared to have all her faculties mustered to keep her truck on the road and the cargo in place. Yeah, that had definitely been racist. As he zoomed away from the truck and down a valley, Ethan dabbed at the beads of sweat forming under his eyebrow. He glanced at the droplets of his long, pale fingers. Like a skeleton's hand, Heather used to say, giggling, Ethan would flick them, the fingers, not the sweat, like he was conducting a marionette and start moving towards her with stilted steps. She would laugh harder and pretend to run away from his creeping zombie, her wavy red hair jumping from side to side as she whipped her head around. Brains, Ethan would moan. Oh no, please, someone save me, his wife squealed. Brains, he repeated. He always got her in the end. Heather would wind up trapping herself in a corner of their condo. He would stagger up to her and pretend to go after her frontal lobe through her mouth, her tongue the last line of defense. His bony hands would hold tight on her back. He could feel her spine against his fingertips as he wiped the sweat on the dashboard. Well, she'd said the previous night, you do whatever it is you feel you need to do. Need, in this instance, echoed with the resigned disdain that Jacob Marley had when addressing his former business partner. After their conversation, her cheeks had seemed sunken, her eyes heavily bagged, an 80s model looking cocaine elegant. At the crest of a hill, three white windmills towered in front of him, collecting electricity for the five or so people who must live in the area. 
Their blades waved languidly in the desert breeze, beckoning him with indifference. Hey, they seemed to say with a shrug. Ethan appreciated their laid-back attitude and their non-accusatory stance. They were the first friendly faces he had seen in days. You do whatever it is you feel you need to do, Heather had said. And if you need to, then go and find this, this... She had held her hand out, palm upward, moving it around as if trying to balance a stack of plates, searching for the right word or phrase to describe the object of her disdain, the reason her husband wanted to drive to Texas immediately on a half-baked detective mission. She settled upon this girl. He felt he read somewhere that a man's reality peaked when he was 18 years old, which made sense, as once his 20s started, he needed more stimulation to keep himself interested. More than none, anyway. If his memory served him, the corresponding peak for women was around 33, meaning his wife only finished her peak three years earlier, while he'd been past his prime for a full 20 years. Ethan never intended to seek out virtual interaction with others. It just built to that point. But even if he misremembered the peak thing, honestly, after years of good to great sex acts mixed in with admittedly mediocre ones, how could that, constant, how could that instant drive for onanism not disappear? Why picture himself fucking when he actually does that a few times a week? Why imagine a magnificent blowjob when he got those from Charlene during college? How exciting were frequently Xerox memories supposed to be? Why wouldn't you seek out anonymous discussions on the internet to keep things exciting for yourself? He rounded a sharp corner. Extending in front of him stood tens, maybe hundreds, of his new friends. The windmill scattered in pairs and clusters of three, little clumps of steady, synchronized turning. Hey, hey. They held their place, burying their feet in the dusty ground, an army amassed for battle, each soldier replicating the lazy salute of his neighbor, waving Ethan across the front line. Hey, hey, hey. The sight startled him, causing him to feel like he was driving straight into an abattoir. Momentarily distracted from his ruminations, he felt his body aching from heat and hunger. A blue sign on the side of the road advertised a diner off the exit a quarter mile away. He guided the car over to the right lane to escape the oncoming assault of blades and slaughter. He didn't bother with the signal this time. Walking into Cook's diner, he felt misplaced. Once the screen door snapped shut behind him, 17 heads turned to look. The men, all but three, wearing cowboy hats and each wearing a plaid flannel shirt, squinted at him reflexively. The denim-clad women eyed him up and down, taking in his lime shirt, chain store jeans, Ray-Ban knockoffs, and scuffed sketchers. What seemed like standard middle-of-the-road wear in L.A. now felt like alien skin. After a short period where the locals made sure to register distrust, they collectively returned to their magazines, sandwiches, and playing cards. Ethan stayed by the door, feeling he might float away at any moment. Any way you want, hon. The older woman in the faded pink uniform waved toward the restaurant from behind the counter. She scrambled for a dinging pot of coffee, then deftly spun to fill two cups on the counter before their owners could think to complain of their emptiness. He picked a small table of splotch for Micah near the salad bar, facing a window to the parking lot. He liked being able to see his vehicle. Not because he didn't trust these people, but because he wanted to remember he could get out if necessary. Two menus stood up from behind the napkin dispenser, and he grabbed one. A buzzing sound rang, rang in his ear. He thought that it was the remnants of the open car windows until he caught a flitting speck in his peripheral vision. A fly hovered over the salad bar, landing on each component on offer, methodically tainting the whole spread. First the lettuce, then the onions followed by the shredded carrots. Ethan stared, riveted. Hey, you hun, the waitress said, appearing at his table holding an order pad. The lines of her crow's feet ran deep, and her bottom row of teeth had merged to a single brown clump. He could see this because she smiled at him sweetly. Can I help you find anything? For a second, he considered answering yes, telling her, sure, she could help him, asking her to get in his car, ride with him to Texas, help him find Delia. Instead, he said, I'll have the hot turkey sandwich. Oh... She sounded as if she just saw the cutest puppy in the whole world scamper head first into a glass door. <laughs> we just ran out of turkey. Oh, great. Really, I mean just like ten minutes ago. She put a hand on the table and leaned forward, a small frown on her lips. I'm really sorry. Ethan looked into her eyes and saw that she was, in fact, really sorry. Deeply so. He almost wanted to stand up and hug her for having such a genuine and un unambiguous feeling on, her, on his behalf. As he moved his eyes back to the menu, he registered that her bra showed slightly between her uniform and her skin, a strip of brown fabric next to the pink shirt. He inhaled a sigh, wishing he didn't still look for details like that. Oh, what 14-year-old Ethan would have done with that image. Not a problem at all. Ham and cheese is fine. You got it. Soup or salad? The buzz resonated in his brain. Soup, please. After the perfectly adequate meal, Ethan stepped out into the twilight. He hadn't paid attention to time all day and hadn't realized the sun had set while he dined. The sky had shifted to a mix of regal purple and medium-rare pink. 
The faint flicker of distant stars and the waxing moon caused the exhaustion lurking inside him to pounce. When he got to his car, he had to balance himself on the hood while pulling the keys out of his pocket. He took a deep breath, reflecting again on just how little he'd prepared for his trip. He'd stuffed his work bag with two extra boxer briefs, a couple of t-shirts, and three socks. Not three pairs, but three socks. One had been bunched up and tricked him into thinking he had picked up two pairs, a mistake he hadn't realized until he was digging his iPod out long after leaving the city. That was it for clothes. Perhaps he could have thought this out a little more logically. Perhaps. Do you have any rooms available, please? I'm sorry? The man at the counter of the roadway inn had a strained look. The accent could be Indian or maybe Pakistani. Ethan felt he should probably know the difference, but he never figured the clues out. Rooms. Yes, sir. Available? Yes, sir. Now? The strained look came back. I'm sorry, he repeated. What was it like being an immigrant from so far away living here in the middle of nowhere, New Mexico, or Arizona? How much flack did this guy get? How squinty did the cowboy's eyes get for him? Did he have his window smashed in after 9-11? Does he have all his papers in order? Uh, any rooms for tonight? Any vacancies? Ah, vacancies. Yes, sir. A smile spread across the man's face. Nobody here. <laughs> Ethan had never seen someone so happy to report their business was doing poorly. The room seemed like a standard shitty chain motel room. The dark brown carpet hid almost all the stains, but none of the cigarette burns. The air conditioner spluttered and shook, but generated the desired coolness. The bathroom had linoleum floors and a toilet just a little too small for an adult to use comfortably. The standardness of it all made him feel comfortable. He positioned his laptop on the small plastic desk in the corner opposite the window, thankful that an establishment that hadn't bought a new light fixture since 1977 had gotten around to installing wireless internet access. He opened his emails, the fatigue of the day's driving, overpowered by a hopeful yearning. His inbox refreshed, and he scanned the bolded messages with increasing disappointment. Nine from friggin' Barry at work, probably wondering why he never showed or sent along the updates for the Alliston case. Three Facebook group updates from high school friends he hadn't cared about since college. Two from Heather, neither with a subject line. And a handful of spam, advertising real estate deals, software sales, and debt consolidation. A pretty full inbox, but no messages from the one person he desperately wanted to hear from. Delia Campbell, the 16-year-old girl who disappeared two weeks ago from his favorite sex chat room. Um, well, it's my opportunity to introduce our next reader, uh, Eric Brock, whose little bio that we have here uh, is that Eric is ready. He's going to take over the world. So uh, I'd like to introduce the slightly less attractive Bradley Cooper, the slightly more attractive Seth Green. You can call him Mr., but he goes by Professor. Eric Brack. <laughs> oh, he is good at that. It's always PT introducing me. Uh, before we start, I just want to say thank you to all the administrators and instructors uh, for teaching and putting up with all of us for the last couple of years. <laughs> And to the students in the front row, probably the exact same thing. Um, man, God, I wish I'd known what you're going to read because I wrote the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, or I should just soft shoe it. Uh, well, I, I did just finish it, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say what I said last time, which is I don't think this is very funny. The shadow-drenched offices of the California Cryobank sit in the Tony L.A. community of Westwood. It's not a Starbucks. There's no sign or inviting floor-to-ceiling plate glass to beckon passers-by. Instead, it waits at the end of an open-air alley, barely visible from the road, its front door guarded by a video intercom system. Its inconspicuousness is both help and hindrance, good in that only people who need to know of it do, and they can come and go secure in their anonymity. Bad in that first-timers struggling to track it down are left with two options. They can cast about along the avenue like lost, helpless chicks, or they can ask a passersby or store owner for directions. No one ever does the latter, and this is understandable. Try to imagine stopping a stranger in the street to ask, excuse me, do you know where I can find the sperm bank? <laughs> Artificial insemination was first suggested when a late 18th century physician named Lazzaro Spallanzani detailed the process of conception. Before then, it was assumed that human reproduction, all animal reproduction, more or less mimicked that of plants, that the seed of a male would be cradled by the woman's nurturing flower until it could blossom. 
Spallanzani found this to be false. After isolating sperm and eggs, he performed the first in vitro fertilizations on frogs and dogs. He even noted the potential to cache semen through freezing it and rendering it immodal. And then he moved on to other studies. It was not until the mid-20th century that the discipline would be seriously pursued. The San Bernardino Valley lies only an hour east of Los Angeles, but it is, in certain ways, an alien place. Joan Didion wrote that in Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream. She also called the land curious and unnatural. But it was in San Bernardino in the 1970s that two young Loma Linda University doctors met, and their impact on the field would be irrefutable. One, a weak-eyed square of a man, was a pathologist named Charles Sims. The other, a gregarious self-promoter from Miami with the thousand-watt smile of a strong club tennis player, was a urologist with the almost defiantly insouciant name of Cappy Rothman. Together, the two shared a vision to open a for-profit center focused entirely on the storage and distribution of sperm. That their idea was fertile enough to bear fruit in the medical domain is unquestionable. The center they birthed, California Cryobank, is believed to be the region's oldest continuously operating facility of its kind. But that the enterprise realized quick commercial success came as a surprise to some, and in the decade that followed its founding, business at the business was good. At outset, the bank focused on administering one-on-one -on -one consultations and dispensing only strictly anonymous specimens. But in time, the demands of profitability led the bank to change its focus. It began to churn out a take-home catalog, offering purchasers a mail-order menu of potential mail product. That, in turn, spawned an internet ordering site where, today, couples can supplement $600 vials of sperm with facial feature reports, audio interviews, and even baby photos. A kind of school portrait shopping extravaganza for hunting down that perfect surrogate dad. What was once a small outpost for furtive, floundering twosomes is now something of a brazen baby mill. The bank boasts of its status as the sixth largest FedEx shipper in all of Southern California. Each year it distributes, or in other words, sells, something in the neighborhood of 25,000 sperm samples. Even neglecting add-ons and fees, that adds up to annual revenues of $15 million, at minimum. And there's not always time to see doctors. Semen, it would seem, has grown into quite a lucrative industry. Hidden in plain sight, like a devilishly camouflaged Easter egg, the offices of the California Cryobank rest just across the street from one of the most garish and obvious structures in all of West L.A., the sprawling Whole Foods supermarket just north of Wilshire Boulevard. While the grocery store echoes with the calls of the elite in this mixing bowl between Malibu, Beverly Hills, and Hollywood, voices in the bank on the other side of the road don't carry that same privileged lilt. Patients, patrons there for treatment hang their heads low, as if embarrassed to admit that nature won't seem to take its course the way it did for their fathers and mothers. And those there to work swallow their L's and clip their long vowels. Sperm banks are not highly sought after assignations for lab techs or medical school students, and positions there tend to fall to the bottom of the lot. The foreign strivers who are willing to do whatever it takes as they carry the mantle of hope for past and future generations. Whether or not they realize the irony of that role is unclear. Finally, there are the bank customers who arrive to make the deposits. And for them, a trip to the Westwood office is a decidedly off-putting affair. The downy odor of jagged hyacinths assaults visitors to the California cryobank. As they shuffle down the brick-lined approach, the walls seem to tower inward, and the feeling that the rolling reaches of UCLA, only steps away in reality, have somehow receded into a desperate hole is all but inescapable. Now, there are plenty of rational arguments, both for and against becoming a surrogate father. To couples having trouble conceiving, donors can be a godsend, yes. But on the flip side, there's that question of morals. Is it acceptable? For egotists, the draw of sprinkling that more of themselves into that posterity pie is alluring. But what if a kid wants to meet his real dad 20 years down the line? And what if he's knocking on the door expecting a kidney? Now, all these assertions are valid, but uh, the real question is one of easy money. Nearly all of you men know the myth, and many have thought about chasing after it as well. You can make thousands of dollars by selling your semen. It seems too good to be true, especially given the lifetimes of offering it to the world for free. 
But just a little investigation reveals the truth behind the magician's curtain. In reality, it isn't so simple. It never is. Sperm selling is not the trade of last chance alcoholics and hobos. <laughs> the analog of that cartoon tramp squirting out half pints of blood for $17 in a cookie does not apply. Less than 1% of prospective sperm donors are accepted, and rejections can be made for any of a dizzying variety of factors. There are, of course, of course the up-close and personal. People who dabble in recreational sex and drugs may unwittingly spread disease, and they've been pulled out of the frozen gene pool since modern HIV screening procedures arose in the 1980s. Then there's family medical history to consider. Someone whose uncle had liver cancer may also be predisposed to it. Since nobody would choose to expose their baby to higher risks than necessary, those with ill relatives are also flushed. Next, there are the odd esoteric distinctions that bar potentials. Those of Ashkenazi Jewish or French Canadian descent, for instance, may carry markers for Tay-Sachs disease. And lastly, there are the physical and personality traits. A few parents to be are willing to take the sperm of someone stupid or grossly overweight when there are other choices available. All of these factors combine to make the barriers to becoming a sperm donor far higher than the ivy line walls surrounding Oxford or Yale. It's actually easier to get into Princeton than it is to get into the national donor roles. Which is why, when I found myself in front of the California cryobank with an appointment slip in my hand, I wondered whether I shouldn't be tackling something easier, perhaps setting my sights a little bit lower than masturbating into a cup. <laughs> The bank ad touted donor stipends in the five figures, which was enough to inspire me to at least show up. And whether I could go through with it or not, whether I could be the shadowy figure that a begotten child would forever envision like a mystery dad game show guest, I wasn't sure. But I arrived for my appointment anyway, an hour early in a suit and tie, because you have to dress like you've already got the job. <laughs> and I told myself that for the money, I better be damn well willing to give it a shot. A young East Asian woman greeted me from behind a glass partition. May I harp you? Her accent underscored my suspicions about the appeal of the work. And even as she rested her fingers on the computer keyboard at the front desk, I noticed she wore latex gloves on both her hands. She passed me a pen and a clipboard with a stack of forms. Furthest out. Name and date every page. Have a seat. I followed her nod into a cubby of a waiting room, which was dominated by a five-gallon water dispenser perched atop a miniature fridge. There were two chairs, between which sat the obligatory Hippocratic pile of woefully out-of-date magazines. A coffee table boasted a wicker basket filled with snack foods, as though anyone here might suddenly find himself lusting after a Snickers bar. And I settled into the only empty seat, noting that a young man occupied the other. Immediately, I took to judging him. In his hip, striped hoodie and blue jeans, I cut him down as being undisciplined and inexperienced. <laughs> and in that moment, I realized two things. Uh, the first was that this had very quickly become to me a real Darwinist competition. <laughs> I was seated next to a potential rival in the flesh, and it was going to be his genetic material or mine that propagated the species. I'd already cast myself as the fittest. The second was that despite the sterile atmosphere, this whole endeavor seemed to be carried along on an undercurrent of shame. My opponent didn't look me in the eye when I entered, and I didn't say hello. And I was grateful not to have to talk to him, not to have to identify myself. Another man entered while I was in the offices, and he rang the intercom, and when the receptionist responded, donor number 12459 was all he said. And his voice droned in a tenor tinge with notes of the Indian subcontinent. Just one more emigre at the cryobank, one more striver willing to work at the bottom of the lot. And was that what this was, I wondered? Was this low work? Was this garbage collecting? Was it stripping? Everything in a sperm bank is designed to be as unmemorable and anonymous as possible. Every experience is tailored to be discarded and swept away. The walls are white or muted mustard or ecru, and floors are covered in gray carpet or in purple. There are no offensive odors. The wall art at California Cryobank is Los Angeles modern, which is to say framed mounted posters of popular movies. And I don't doubt that depositories in Texas have pictures of prairies and open ranges, and in Iowa, feedlots and corn. It's the kind of thing you can look at and not remember at all. 
And the collection rooms, too, there are five, are designed to be nearly identical. Three are in the front, and when unoccupied, their doors are all open, and two more wait around the corner of a short hall. All are cramped, measuring at most about four feet by six, and each features a sink stocked with hand pumps of pink liquid soap and copious paper towels. Leatherette topped office seats, posted directly in front of wall-mounted televisions like children who've not been taught to sit farther back from the glass, are the only other items of furniture. And above an industrial wainscoting of cheap tile, their interior walls are covered in a mosaic of nudes, topless and smoking cigarettes in the continental fashion, posed against an architectural curio, bathing. It is in these rooms that the veneer of medical science dissolves into prurience. As with a child going in for his first vaccination, what's never discussed beforehand in sperm banks is the mode d'emploi of the whole process. The terminology they use just dances around it. An emission schedule, specimen cup, sample collection. But that only works until the moment the needle appears, at which point the kid begins to cry. <laughs> the switches on the wall in these personal cells activate both a light and a heating vent. And at outset, it's difficult to fathom why anyone wants such a device in what is effectively a windowless box. It causes the rooms to reach sweat-inducing levels within minutes. Once the show begins, as it were, once the video screen springs to life and the patient realizes what the good doctors intend, the purpose of the heaters becomes easy to ascertain. They're loud. <laughs> loud enough to mask the noises of the donors from each other. And suddenly there's no more need to question the nurse's insistence on wearing gloves. <laughs> Some men decide that professional sperm donation is not for them, and this is understandable. Because whether or not they pass the abstruse phases of testing, the cold reality of the offer, to become a paid man in the stable, trading under a constructed replacement identity, it hits harder than expected. It's not all fun and games. I mean, it's not garbage collecting either, nor is it stripping, but it's close enough. It forces people to desensitize and expose a private, personal aspect of themselves. Donating semen does not leave one feeling at wonder for the miracle of life. Uh, there is not even, in point of fact, any moment of Darwinian conquering glory. Perhaps this is the one reason it took two centuries for artificial insemination to catch on, why Spallanzani moved from frogs and dogs to digestion and sonar, because it feels, like Didion San Bernardino, distinctly alien, curious, and unnatural. And as easy as it sounds, there are plenty of other ways for men to make money. And while the hollow feeling is none of his business, nothing more than a cash exchange was promised, after all, one has to wonder, was this really how Cappy Rothman first envisioned it? Thanks. We've got good writer, good guy. <laughs> Carlos Castellanos is a writer and teacher from Los Angeles. A true Angeleno, he received his bachelor's degree from UCLA and a master's from here at USC. Right on. <laughs> the end of the month, he'll be joining Teach for America and moving to Hawaii, where he will continue fulfilling both his passion for teaching and writing. Ladies and gentlemen, Carlos Castellanos. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to my friends, uh, faculty, the administration. Um, it means a lot for you guys to be here and uh, for the support. Um, I'm going to be reading an essay uh, titled Breadcrumbs and Alterations. And um, it's a part of my um, collection of essays, my longer piece, um, that primarily begins with my upbringing um, with a lot of very, very, very strong female figures in my life and transitioning into my uh, self-discovery of um, what it means to be a man. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, first part is called Breadcrumbs. I kept lighting them up, one Marlboro light after the next on the 30-minute drive to Inglewood to meet with Dad and Grandpa. No matter how much my throat burned with each puff or how much my clothes would smell by the time it came to awkward hugs in front of the men's warehouse, I kept them coming. Must have smoked about 15 of them, 
One for every year I hadn't seen my grandfather. One for every year it took me to get over the resentment I harbored toward my dad. Your grandpa doesn't want the surgery, my dad had explained to me on the phone back in May. And with that statement alone, he told me all the things my grandfather did want. To avoid another bypass surgery, let nature take its course, and ride out the remaining miles of his 81-year-old engine on the road to his final resting place. He was stubborn, tired, and just wanted to die. No more tests, pre-op instructions, or painful tears from loved ones. No more months of recuperating in bed, no more bullshit. Your aunt wants me to buy your grandpa a suit, you know, to get ready. Dad's voice was shaky and wrapped in a sadness unfamiliar to me. I've never seen him cry, and though I wasn't in the slightest prepared to hear him cry, I was at least grateful I wouldn't have to witness it in person. I wouldn't know how to console him anyway. Would I put my arm around him, hug him, pat him on the back? If it were mom, a friend, or even a colleague or a classmate, I'd know exactly what to do in that situation. But this was dad, and dad was different. I'll go with you if you want, I replied on impulse. Before I had time to retract my offer, his voice lit up with a high-pitched, really? I didn't know what I had just gotten myself into. Sure, I explained. I don't know if I'll get to see him before he goes, and I can't imagine how hard it must be for you. It was true. I couldn't imagine how hard it must have been for him because I didn't know the kind of relationship they had. All I had to go on was the shaky uncertainty in his voice, and somehow that was enough to muster up some empathy. What I could imagine was how difficult it would be for me to take my mom shopping one last time to help her pick out her final outfit on earth, and how it would mean the world for me to have a son, daughter, or friend by my side to distract me. I imagine it would mean the world for any child prepping a parent for death to not have to go at it alone. And so I think I did it more out of sympathy for all father-son relationships in the world and less for my own. So there I was, driving down Normandy Avenue, smoking my cigarettes, carelessly flicking each one out the window and lighting another at almost every red light. I imagined them each landing on the pavement with the splash of hot embers, invisible in the bright daylight, then rusting along the road, smoke still rising from the tips. By the time we'd be done picking out a suit for Grandpa, they would all be burned out completely. Snow globes. I arrived at the men's warehouse, a suit where they guarantee you'll like the way you look. About 15 minutes late, pulling into the parking lot, I noticed that Dad and Grandpa were waiting in the car. I don't know why, but I was a little disappointed they'd waited for me before going in the store. I guess I had hoped they'd already be inside trying on suits. I had imagined my grandfather tucked away in some fitting room, and upon coming out to study himself in the mirror, he would notice me in the reflection. And in my fantasy, his eyes would light up, He'd turn around in amazement at how much I've grown and how handsome I've become. <laughs> he'd run toward me with an open-mouthed smile and teary eyes and hug me as if he'd found the one thing he'd been searching the far ends of the earth to find. But that's hardly how it played out. I pulled into the spot to the right of my father's car. My grandpa and I opened our doors at the same time and almost bumped them. I shut my door and let him get out first out of politeness, but mostly because I was more concerned with not denting my car door. Once I squeezed out of my truck, I looked at him and was surprised at how small he was. He wasn't the same tall, lanky old man I remembered. The man now standing in front of me had shrunk. Although he was now shorter, he maintained the same posture I remembered as a kid. A straight back, arms hanging directly at his sides, the right hand tapping the outside of his thigh as if beating on a drum only he could hear. He was wearing the same clothes I remembered, too. Dark khaki pants, an olive green dress shirt, a brown wicker belt, and worn out brown slip-ons. I stared at his face for a while, and it surprised me that looking at him now at 25 evoked the same thoughts I had at 11, that there was no way in hell I could possibly be related to this man. His skin was white, about 10 shades lighter than mine, I'd say. His hair wasn't nearly as thick or dark as mine, Sure, he was balding now and didn't have much of it left on his head, but I remembered how, when he had hair, it revealed hints of golden blonde slowly fading into gray. Then there were his eyes. It was the eyes that always did it for me. Made me feel like I wasn't his, or like the image of me in them disappointed him somehow. They are the clearest blue eyes I have ever seen, and they hadn't changed one bit. 
They aren't the kind of deep blue that pops no matter what color shirt the person wears, nor were they the kind of striking blue that is noticeable from across the room. They were transparent almost, like empty fish bowls or unshaken snow globes. Hola, Carlos, he said as he extended his hand to me. There was no hug, no open mouth smile, no tears. At least he won't smell the cigarette smoke on me, I reasoned. His grip was strong, not the kind of grip you'd expect from a man with a failing heart. Aumentaste de peso, está bien, he said as he looked me up and down. You gained weight, that's good. Normally, when someone tells me I've gained weight, I automatically take it as an insult and change up my diet and exercise regimen. <laughs> but hearing it from Grandpa, I was proud. Proud because I assumed he meant that I looked healthy, grown up, like a man. After all, in the Mexico he grew up in, for a man to gain weight is a good thing. Being well-fed means there are women in your life fulfilling their duties. <laughs> it's been 15 years. I sure hope I gained some, I replied in Spanish. <laughs> but he didn't laugh at my joke. He didn't so much as blink. You have to speak up or talk directly into his ear, my dad said as he came around the back of the car to where we were standing. He's almost completely deaf, he whispered into my ear as he hugged me. I looked over to my grandfather, ready to repeat myself, but another glimpse into his eyes stopped me from speaking. I merely smiled at him and stayed quiet. Too much time had passed, and the joke would no longer be funny. Clumps. As we approached the glass doors, I caught a glimpse of our reflection in them. My grandpa stood to the left, my dad in the middle, and I on the right. Despite the opaque contortions in the glass, you could still tell us apart. My grandpa with his shiny bald head and radiant white skin. My dad with his receding salt and pepper mane and bronzed complexion. Then me in all my brown glory. We were a walking transition from light to dark, old to young, and my grandfather and I stood at opposite ends of the spectrum with my dad as the buffer. He was the necessary link between generations that made sense of the otherwise unbelievable kinship I shared with my grandfather. Without dad standing there between us, Grandpa and I would look like the strangers we had become. A light-skinned, green-eyed black man named Richard welcomed us as we entered the men's warehouse. Good afternoon, gentlemen. What can we do for you today? He asked with the smile I'm sure he'd perfected in order to gain customer trust. But what I, at that moment, took for an understanding of the complexities of genetic makeup that he saw in us. Complexities that gave Richard the rare yet captivating pairing of green eyes, and dark skin, but that stripped me of my grandfather's blue eyes and fair skin. I wondered how his father and grandfather looked, wondered if he knew them better than I knew mine. We need two suits, my dad expl expl explained, one for my dad and one for my son. No, I'm okay, dad, I quickly interjected, surprised at his comment. You don't have to buy me a suit. The words in my mouth tasted sour probably because I've used them many times in numerous resentful and passive-aggressive ways where I, as a wounded teenager, would say things to him like, you don't have to help me pay tuition, I got a scholarship, or you don't have to come to my graduation, mom and grandma will be there, so that he could see that I could get along just fine without him. Furthermore, the thought that maybe he felt the need to pay me for accompanying him on this task made my stomach turn, perhaps because I didn't want him to think that that was my intention all along, that I somehow turned my grandfather's inevitable death into an opportunity for free clothes. Do you already have a suit? he asked. The confused look on his face was no match for Richard's. I felt my face blush and my cheeks grow warm, not so much because I cared with what Richard thought, but because I realized that I indeed did not own a suit, and the idea of confessing that made me embarrassed. For me, a suit symbolizes manhood a staple component of every real man's wardrobe. For some, suits comprise everyday work attire. For others, they are only utilized during special occasions like weddings, galas, or funerals. For me, revealing, that my father, revealing to my father that I didn't already have a suit would be like admitting to him that we, mom and I, were always too poor to afford one, that it was always easier to borrow one from a cousin for job interviews or award ceremonies keeping oversized pants up with the belt that would make the excess materials protrude below the waistline in unflattering clumps of fabric by my crotch or buttocks or both. <laughs> you can keep your pants up with the belt and then hide the clumps with your jacket. Just remember not to take it off, my mom would always say to 
<laughs> to try and make me feel better, as if turning the situation into a game of sorts would dull the helplessness she must have felt during those times. Admitting I didn't already have a suit would be like admitting that I indeed hadn't gotten along just fine without him, that I used to hate him for never sending us child support so that I could have a tailored suit of my own to wear proudly on ceremonial school days or wear confidently in front of intimidating interviewers. I don't know how I managed to think of all that in the few seconds after Dad's question. That's probably why my face was flushed, why my cheeks were warm. Because even though my head couldn't process the past that quickly, my heart could, and was thus trying to catch my brain up with the sentiment that's been dwelling in the chest cavity for years. Well, no, I replied, looking down at the floor as if I was being punished. But I don't really need one. Every man needs a suit, Richard shouted, as if, he's, as, if he's, as if he heard his cue to jump in. As much as I hated to admit it, Richard was right. Sons, grandsons, fathers, every man eventually needs a suit. I looked over at Grandpa and saw that he had exited the conversation and was in his own silent world, tapping the side of his thigh again, creating a soundtrack for his thoughts, waiting for us to get the show on the road. Alterations. Are you sure it's okay? I asked my father for the third time when we made our way to the store's west wall, completely curtained with suits of every color. Even though I knew very well it was okay, or else he wouldn't have offered, I couldn't help but ask one more time. Yeah, come on, let me do this for you, he replied, his hazel eyes softening. It wasn't so much his eyes as it was his wording that convinced me. He didn't say, I want to do this for you, though it would carry the same sentiment. Instead, he said, let me. And with that, he gave me the control, put the ball in my court, allowed me to make the decision to grant him the opportunity to reconcile our differences and mend it with the suit. So I let him buy me one let him feel, for the first time in 13 years, like he was doing something right. I'm not sure which one of us gave Richard the hardest time, my grandpa by just saying yes to any suit we showed him, or me finding any flaw in the ones presented to me. After making our selections, a soft olive-colored suit for my grandpa and a traditional black one for me, we made our way to the fitting rooms. We were placed in adjacent fitting rooms, there were in adjacent dressing rooms, there was something comforting about the fact that he was next to me, and although we were separated by a wall, knowing he was just on the other side, trying on a suit with me, made me feel like we indeed had something in common. As I slipped out of my everyday clothes, I looked in the mirror and wondered what other possible similarities Grandpa and I might have. Did he have a birthmark on the inside of his right knee, too? Did he wear boxer briefs like me, or tidy whities like I imagined him? Does he put his pants on left foot first like I do? Does he button them up, then pull up the zipper, or the other way around? I was desperate to find a connection. After all, he was dying, and I wanted to find some characteristic in me, anything by which to remember him. As I slipped on my jacket and was ready to head out, I heard a very familiar sound. It was an airy, high-pitched whistle, the kind that requires the right spaces between one's teeth, the kind you can't produce with lips alone. It was my grandpa's signature whistle which I had almost completely forgot about. It was the whistle that used to accompany our bus rides home from school when my grandpa used to pick me up. I suddenly remembered those days when he'd be waiting for me on the corner of Overland and National with his trademark earth-toned ensemble. I was in second grade just after my sister was born and neither mom nor dad could pick me up from school. With dad at work and mom home with the baby, grandpa filled in for those few months. I don't remember much about those trips just seeing him sta standing at the bus stop, tapping his thigh, as he always did. Then me falling asleep in my seat to the bus's vibrations accompanied by Grandpa's airy whistle. He was my after-school lullaby, and hearing him now in the dressing rooms was all the connection I needed. I stepped out of the fitting rooms first and made my way to the elevated, brightly lit platform with wall-sized mirrors on each side. Richard came over and started tugging my sleeves and adjusting the pants at my waist. The sleeves were a bit long, and the, balloon, and the pants ballooned out. Looks good, he said. Really? I asked, looking at my reflection. No matter which of the three mirrors I looked into, I didn't like the way I looked. Well, of course the sleeves and pants need to be taken in, but uh, I think it's a good fit, he replied. Let me go get Carmen, our seamstress. I looked over at Dad, seated in a chair directly behind me. He was pensive, 
sitting patiently with his elbow on the armrest and a hand on his cheek. I motioned to him, shrugging my shoulders as if to ask what he thought. He just winked at me, smiled, and nodded his head. Turning around and facing the mirrors once again, I decided I loved the suit. So what's the occasion? Richard asked me when he returned with Carmen, a skirt-wearing, high-heel-toting Mexican seamstress in her mid to late fifties. The question caught me by surprise, and I didn't know how to answer him. I thought about just saying it was for a funeral, but before I opened my mouth, my dad chimed in with, it's for a birthday. Does Grandpa have a birthday coming up? <laughs> Richard exclaimed. I wished he would shut up. <laughs> Carmen, uh, I wished he would just shut up and let Carmen finish marking my suit up with chalk. No, my niece is having a quinceanera at the end of the month, and he doesn't have anything to wear. Dad and I made eye contact through the mirror. He winked at me again, this time without a smile and a nod. Okay, you all done, Carmen said in broken English. <laughs> Relieved, I stepped down from the platform and headed back to the dressing rooms. When I got there, Grandpa was standing outside his door, just whistling to himself and tapping some more beats on his thigh. He'd been waiting patiently for someone to come get him, and I don't know why, but the sight of him just standing there made me want to laugh. Perhaps because it reminded me of the way he'd wait for me at the bus stop, or because he looked so handsome in a suit. Maybe both. I grabbed his arm and escorted him over to the mirrored platforms before going back into the room to change. When I stepped out, I saw Carmen working meticulously around Grandpa, but she was smiling and giggling the whole time. Grandpa's eyes were chasing her reflection in each of the mirrors, and it didn't take long to understand what was going on. We're going to have to take away five inches from the bottom, she told him in Spanish as she, pay, as she played with the fabric around his ankles. I'd like you more if you could take away five years instead of inches, he replied. <laughs> Couldn't believe that at 81 years old, Grandpa was hitting on shy little Carmen. <laughs> they went back and forth for a good while, flirting and laughing. Call me crazy, but for that moment, it seemed as if Carmen had indeed stripped five years off of my aging Grandpa. After all, he seemed to be hearing her just fine. She didn't have to repeat anything or lean into his ear when she spoke. I turned to my dad, who looked relieved and was laughing to himself. The thought of his own dad dying had escaped him, at least for that moment. Carmen spent an even longer time adjusting Grandpa's jacket. Not because she was necessarily enjoying the special attention he was giving her, but because it somehow didn't look right in the back. Tenemos que subirle mucho aquí, she said, as she chalked all kinds of vertical lines by the shoulders and upper back. She proceeded to tell my grandpa that code alterations were the most expensive, but that she wouldn't include them all in the bill, just the most obvious ones, solo las más obvias. Que queda como sea, he replied. The five years Carmen stripped away, now coming back to him. No importa como me queda de atrás. He was right. It didn't matter how the coat looked in the back. Grandpa, Dad, and I all knew it. The next time he'd wear it, he'd be lying on his back eyes closed, asleep. Well, it matters to me, she said, bringing one last smile to my grandpa's face. While grandpa changed out of his suit, Richard showed us some shirt and tie combinations. I let dad choose mine, he let me choose grandpa's. At the register, dad paid for the suits and Richard reminded us that they'd be ready for pickup in exactly one week. Thank you for shopping men's warehouse today and enjoy your party, he told us as he handed dad the receipt. We made our way back out to the parking lot where we said our goodbyes. I hugged my grandpa and he told me it was nice to see me. And I replied with the same. I thanked dad again and hugged him goodbye. I wanted to tell him that I hoped I would see my grandpa again, but I didn't know how to. I wanted to tell him what this trip meant to me, but that's not the way he and I communicate. As I sat in my truck and watched them drive away, I was overwhelmed with all the things I didn't get to say to grandpa. Things that I either couldn't think about in the store or that I didn't find appropriate to talk about as we were getting fitted. I didn't get to tell Grandpa about my new job, about my sister and how she just turned 18, or about the fact that I'll be graduating in May and that it'd be nice to see him there wearing his new olive green suit. Following my trail of cigarette butts back home on Normandy, I understood that we Castellanos men say more with silence, that sometimes a wink and a nod mean more than declarations of acceptance, that losing your hearing means you start listening to what really matters, that sometimes all it takes is a whistle to remind you that someone will always be there patiently waiting for you to show up. Thank you.
So, fighting out of the blue corner, a man who needs no introduction, standing 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing in at 218 pounds, he is the current undisputed, undefeated heavyweight champion of the world, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brad Rochefort. Thanks for coming, everybody. Good to see you. New faces, old faces. Um, I'm going to read some stuff. Check the time. Half an hour for me, yeah? <laughs> Breaking stuff already. All right. Um, yeah, I want to thank Aram in the back for helping with my poetry. He turned it from junk into something, so thanks. <laughs> and I'll start with this one. It's called Away with Words. Hop a plane to nowhere, put your hair under a hat, dive for turtles, collect trinkets, sip chilled potions, write postcards to locals, sing karaoke with gusto to new friends from the bus, go build a beach fire, watch stars fall for one another, cover your toes in sand, hold hands, let your eyes say the rest. Some of these, Aram tells me I should be a scientist or fact-based, like this one. It's called The Collider. In 17 miles of tunnel, scientists in the world's biggest basement train set finally found a good time. The physics version of tasting both jellies of a chocolate eclair and a Boston cream sent into one subatomic donut. Magnets and laser beams push microscopic streams time and again Make perfect jelly ring inside. Twenty years of science collide in one moment. My only question, when do we get to eat the donut? <laughs> this one's about mischief. Police cruiser. Tail lights illuminate mud-covered sneakers as they tear sod. Time slows to an underwater crawl. You dig your heels in. Clench a porch chair, hoist it, hurl it, rejoice as the legs scatter like spear gun harpoons across asphalt soaked in moonlight. Rear view mirrors fog in the breath of mischief. Muddy sneakers tear across lawns of strangers. The only siren rattles from your lungs. It's called First Chair. This is an anecdote. Once getting a haircut, there was this moment. The neighbor, speaking little English, came in to thank the barber for getting her mail. She sang Amazing Grace. In a humble voice, she understood what those words meant. In that brief moment, silent in the chair, so did I. It's another way to think about yourself. Black hole fighter. Ground a lighter, physics law smiter. I, a living spaceship, an effort-based vehicle, my bony chassis, a galactic assembly of calcium plants. Milky Way beams within skin panels, I boost with muscle strands fueled by liquid iron circuits. These tributaries transfuse digits, limbs, trunk alike, irrigate with mi minerals I commandeer, flood interior planes, Steer each day the way the moon rocks the sea nightly, surely, lightly. This is called Love is a Rocky Road. And it's about the movie Rocky. <laughs> Forced on a date, they ice skate, bond. He kisses her. She keeps him company, solves his loneliness. Though her bully barks, she heals his wounds. She feeds him, they embrace, she defends herself, the bully is no more. They shack up, she sleeps peacefully, she comforts him. And another science one, the tree's life, Feynman's ode. I think Aram was recommending a bit of an explanation. This is a physicist's explanation of how a tree grows more than poetry. I just tried to explain Richard Feynman's concept of physics. And I used a tree's life. So this one goes, oak tree seed, 
heaven dropped, attracts molecules. As they fall, space dandruff collects, stacks tall. Oak tree eats air grapes, chewed by sunlight. Carbon seeds spit. Roots sprout to drink from that atomic compost heap of settled sour space balls we call groundwater. I think I've used about five minutes, so I'm going to read a short story I wrote. It's just a couple pages long. It's called Out of Juice. My robot died today, which is fine if you've got the parts. Sixteenth <laughs> generation Sony pre-bots, the kind with no moving internal parts, all silicone, solar powered. I'm supposed to fix that? Today, anyone can fuse metal at home, but without a supply of liquid magnets, how am I going to make it move? I'm stuck, and that's why today I'm walking. Fifty stories down, no water, nothing packed for the walk back up. And the only filter mask I've got is from two generations ago, made to break down emissions from G14s built with lithium. The sun hits the top of my head, and I feel it start. Damn feeling is, I just need yours till Friday. Too bad it's Thursday, and I'm out of practically everything. Magnets, masks, seeds, patients... I can get most of that from the market at Fifth and Flower, but I have to use credit. Three years into the new government, we're paying interest by the hour, and I run out of cash. Two bottles, thanks. The kid with the beard always takes too long. The old lady, I think it's his aunt, she dives into the back. You wipe your forehead, she's already popped her head out like a gopher, grinning, her old world muscles sweating through her sundress. She wore simple patterns, handmade stuff found only in history books and musty ground floor shops. And clothes made for floors 35 through 70, the sticky ground heat itches. Life has changed. With my G16, all this is a breeze. Pre-bots can power the elevator, run an errand, soak up enough solar to make the journey back in under 90 minutes. Now I'm buying water, lunch on the street, hang with borrowed money, borrowed time. I slip my hand inside the pocket of a kid, passed out, slumped in the doorway behind the seed shop, feel for half a handful, let it go before I take my hand back. This is the future? I never used to be a thief. Eighty years ago, less than a thousand people had pre-bots. Build ten cheap apartment units, cut the rent by 800 a week. Next, you got more than half the people of downtown L.A. cooped up inside. GPS, remote voice activation, steering robots past rows of merchandise was easier than making toast. Best part? Some shops bought solar from you, waved off credit fees, didn't even touch the machine. I keep my collar up, my eyes down, too many broadcasting their bots lately. Should be a crime. Cashing in on bounties for wanted men. Catching bad creditors like some damn vigilante. My wristwatch gets me enough for the mask and the water. If it's still there tomorrow, I can barter with some solar, load up the pre-bot with some G15 parts, get it back. I doubt it. Back in my lobby, I glance at the security camera. Pants tied around my neck, the legs tied to the handles of each bottle of liquid magnets. I start to climb. The power drought happened faster than we predicted. The tail end of a bear market. Stock drops 20 points in two months. Pre-bots become the Walmart of our generation. Cheap, available everywhere, and creating just enough jobs to not notice the imbalance. We couldn't resist them. Loan sharks sold them on the streets. No deposit, taking the solar, selling it to stores. They say it got worse overseas. No emission laws, looser quality standards. People trapped in their apartments going days with no power. Black markets that ran odds on the daily price of solar. Dark times. We all thought solar panels would be everywhere. Pre-bots uh, makers buy the panels in bulk. You're lucky if you can get enough juice to run your fridge with anything aftermarket. The demand was so great. Me, I can't spare 15 minutes between repairs. And Phil still finds the words to sell me. When I sell the bots I fixed, then you'll get your money. And I can't sell what ain't fixed. And I can't fix what I ain't got the parts to fix it with. I think he was born with a coil in his throat. You're making me dizzy, Phil. Just take the damn things. I liked it better when he sent his bot over to pick up parts. I could ignore the machine. I power up the screen, start reading, he sits. I take notes, face buried in the pile of parts renting my desktop. He stands by the window, lights a smoke. Hell of a view! Phil shuts the window, the last breath of smoke hits the pane. Gotta get going, he stretches, opens the fridge. It's empty. I don't even turn to watch. He finds something. I hear him chew as he puts his shoes on. See you tomorrow, that's what he always says. Last time it was two weeks before he came back, but I had cash to float myself. Liquid assets. All this on my mind, and she moves in across the hall. Cheery, perky, time on her hands. What you doing, neighbor? Heaven help me. She's dressed for the beach every day, bikini top, short shorts, no shoes. I keep telling myself I only let her over because she shares her food with me. 
frou-frou junk, sure, but it beats the 50-flight climb. It was bound to happen. I just knew it. Hey, neighbor, want some wine? Her uncle had a stockpile mailed her son, she tells me. Girls like this are trouble. First it's dinner, then it's wine. Soon you're watching her instead of your own future, watching her pat her chest down every five minutes as the workday slips away. Hot summer. No kidding, baby, no kidding. She leans in finally, tilts her head, grins, looks away, looks back real innocent-like. My apartment's different than yours, I think. Can I see your bedroom? Here we go. Next up, we have Susan Caldwell reading some fiction. And it reads, The Three Great Loves of Sean Bravado tells the story of three very different women haplessly in love with the same man. Alicia, Sean's closest friend, constantly struggles with her feelings for Sean and develops the courage to reveal them in the face of a shocking truth. Susan Caldwell, everyone. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. I want to say thank you to Rita Williams because she was my thesis advisor also. And she helped me tremendously with this excerpt. It's from, like you said, it's from my novel. And um, I'm actually reading the first section from the second girl whose name is Alicia. And she's 13 in this scene and seeing um, her unrequited love for the first time. Before Sean, Alicia's crushes had been fleeting and shallow. She noticed a boy on the street, on the train, or at school, and because there might be something peculiar about him, say, a mole on his cheek or his pigeon-toed gait, she'd imagine they were boyfriend and girlfriend. She'd imagine them holding hands, walking down a long, empty hallway at school, or along Flatbush Avenue after school, him carrying her books like boys did in the old days. She'd imagine their first kiss, the sweet and urgent press of his lips against her cheek. She'd carry those fantasies around for a day or so, never concerning herself with feasibility or outcomes until some other random fascination took over her thoughts. Within the succession of pretend boyfriends who drifted in and out of Alicia's imagination, somehow she got stuck on Sean. Among the other teenage boys that hung out on the corner of Garvey and Devereaux, clogging the sidewalk in front of the bodega and charging the air with mischief, Sean seemed more serious and reserved, more, in a reserve, more, of, an, more of an observer and he had a certain melancholy about him that mystified Alicia and made her feel connected to him. When the boys clustered together to, into a freestyle cipher, she noticed he was a designated beatboxer. He'd cover his mouth with his, both his hands, move his head spastically from side to side to the staccato beats his mouth made, and in his eyes there was an abandon that intrigued Alicia so much she almost wanted to look away. But of course she never could. With him, she graduated from fantasies to yearnings. She yearned to see him smile, know his secrets. Now this was a revolution for Alicia. She was a meek girl with modest hopes. The one thing in the world that she wished for the most, for her parents to be alive again, would never come true. So she usually had no use for wishes. Yet the entire spring of her 13th year, Alicia yearned and wished for Sean. She knew very well to him that to him, he was not, she was nothing. She was just another nameless little girl from the block. She was much too young for him and chubby with mosquito bites for breasts, a greasy, unremarkable face, and braces. She thought the worst thing in the world that could happen was for Sean to outright reject her if she were to make her feelings known, but she didn't have to worry about that because she never would. Instead, the second worst thing happened. Her cousin, Justine, started liking Sean. Justine lived in the Bronx, but spent long stretches of time in the summer with their grandfather and, and Alicia in Brooklyn. On a hot and aimless Sunday afternoon, the two girls found themselves idling at the bodega on Garvey and Devereaux, standing before a glass refrigerator of beverages. They were tossing silly ideas between themselves about what they would do with the money they could win from underneath a winning bottle cap, when Justine suddenly got quiet and said, Cutie Cam. Where? Alicia asked. Walking in. Alicia turned in the direction of Justine's gaze and saw Sean walking into the bodega. He was wearing stonewashed overalls with one suspender unhooked, and an afro pick lodged into the side of his flat top, partially covering his eye. I'm going to go walk past him, Justine said. <laughs> Alicia followed Justine at the distance. Watching her, she ducked into the aisle where Sean stood. Excuse me, Justine said as she eased in front of him in the aisle, switching her newly widened 15-year-old hips the way she and Alicia had practiced. 
Of course, Sean turned to look at her as she passed, kept his gaze on her until she was no longer in view. Boys loved Justine. She had the fiery beauty of the Jimenez women, the expressive semicircle eyes, the dimples, the thick, straight, jet black indio hair. Alicia's mother and Justine's mother were close in age and had often been mistaken for twins, just as Alicia and Justine were often thought to be sisters. But fortunately for Justine, she had inherited her physique from her father's side, so she was petite with curves and just enough thickness. Justine was a gem of her own neighborhood of Morris Heights in the Bronx, an exotic gem in East New York, Brooklyn. Sean must have felt Alicia's eyes on him, because now he was looking at her with his eyebrows raised sheepishly. Alicia smiled back, but not with the mature, closed-lipped smile she'd practiced. In her excitement, she bared her teeth, revealing braces with rubber bands that alternated between orange and neon green. <laughs> <laughs> Vominos, Justine said to her, grabbing her arm. The two girls walked out of the bodega and stood in front of the payphone by the entrance, waiting for Sean. Moments later, Sean walked out, opening a bag, big bag of Utz potato chips. There was an assured fluidity in his walk, like he had just been reminded of his maleness. Next to her, Alicia could feel Justine's body tense up. Alicia knew that this was the beginning of something. Sean walked over to Justine. What's your name, girl? <laughs> Justine, she answered, shifting her weight from one hip to the other. Take a walk with me, Justine. I don't even know you, Justine said, half sweet, half attitude. Alicia loved watching Justine in action. She knew how to pursue someone while making him think he was the one pursuing her. Well, you can get to know me, Sean said. My name is Sean. I live on Mackenzie and Garvey. How come I never seen you before? Maybe you wasn't looking, Sean said. And there it was, his smile. Mischievous little boy and old man at the same time. Even though it wasn't directed at her, it made her feel, for the first time ever, that tingle and flutter, that heave and crash down there. Sean and Justine exchanged a few more words and slowly began walking together down the block. At the corner, they exchanged numbers. After a brief courtship, Sean and Justine became boyfriend and girlfriend. This was another thing for Alicia to bear, and she did so by constantly reminding herself that she wouldn't have had a chance with Sean anyway. At least with Justine as Sean's girlfriend, she had someone close to her that she could live vicariously through. And so she threw herself into all manner of tasks involving Sean and Justine. She helped Justine pick out the outfits Sean might like, help her with her hair and makeup, catered to her like a bridesmaid to a bride. She played third wheel, accompanying Justine to the corner or to the park to meet Sean. When their grandfather was taking a nap or out somewhere, they snuck Sean into the basement, and it was Alicia's job to sit in the stairway between the kitchen and the basement and look and listen out for their grandfather, who would surely send Justine back to the Bronx for good if Sean was caught in the house. Sometimes they went to Sean's apartment five blocks away, where Sean lived with his aunt. While Sean and Justine did whatever they did behind the closed door of Sean's aunt's bedroom, Alicia waited in the cluttered living room that doubled as Sean's bedroom. She sat still and quiet there, in awe of Sean's belongings surrounding her, in awe of the very couch on, what he, on which he, she sat, where Sean tossed and turned and dreamed every night. Her eyes feasted on Sean's belongings, his clothes neatly folded and stacked in the corner next to the TV, his few pairs of sneakers lined up against the wall by the radiator, the random personal effects on a glass coffee table, a Swiss Army knife, a notebook with a crude sketch of the Yankees logo on its cover. She didn't dare touch the notebook for fear that they would come out from the bedroom unexpectedly and catch her looking through it. Once though, she did take one of his Yankees caps from the end of the arm of the couch. She hid it under her shirt as she rushed past Sean's aunt's bedroom door to the bathroom. First she brought it to her nose, captivated by the smell of leaves, hair oil, dirt, and sweat. She put it on her own head and smiled at herself in the mirror. Sean, Reginald Banks, she whispered. Among other things, Alicia learned Sean's full name from one of her and Justine's nightly conversations when they climbed into the queen-size bed and lay over the covers, and Justine went on and on about Sean. Justine gave thorough recaps of her time with Sean that day, relaying all the details, everything said, and Alicia was a committed listener. One such night in the middle of July, Justine made one of the most momentous announcements one teenage girl can make to another. Me and Sean did it, she said. Alicia gasped. I don't believe you, she whispered, and set up to look into Justine's face in the darkness. The street light in front of the house flickered, and Alicia could just make out Justine's dreamy smile. Did you for real? What did it feel like? It's like, you know what it's like when you take a big caca? Well, it's kind of like that, only it's... <laughs> <laughs> only it's through the other hole and it goes in and out. <laughs> Alicia wrinkled her face. 
And that feels good. <laughs> it feels it feels like better than anything. Alicia felt her cheeks burn. She lay back down on the pillow, trying to control her breathing, acutely aware of her heartbeat. She faced Justine. As afflicted with jealousy as she was, she could not resist her curiosity. She asked Justine for details upon details. As Justine relinquished them, Alicia closed her eyes and imagined it the way Justine told her. She imagined Sean's aunt's bedroom with the shimmering purple bread spread Alicia had once caught a glimpse of, and her and Sean standing next to that bed as he and Justine had, naked. She tried to imagine what Sean looked like naked, but it was fuzzy around the midsection area because she'd never seen a real-life grown boy's penis. She imagined having Sean's eyes on her naked body, what it would feel like for him to want her. She remembered the smell of his cap and wondered what his tongue felt like, tasted like. Justine said Sean licked her all over her body, and Alicia imagined Sean doing that to her. That was as far as Alicia went, though. Penetration and the mechanics of sex, based on Justine's description, seemed too odd, too abstract for Alicia, so she focused on the word Justine used. Ecstasy. Kissing, nakedness, the vague business of penetration and all that, then ecstasy. Alicia imagined it with Sean, and it became her obsessive thought for the rest of the summer, and it continued to persist when school started, and it wasn't until Romero Irizarry came into her world that she could stop thinking of it completely. When Justine was in a peevish mood, which was often, she'd go back to the Bronx for a few days without telling Sean. He'd come over looking for her, and when Alicia told him he wasn't there, he'd stay. He had nothing better to do, he said. Over tedious sessions of chess, video game matches, and card games, their friendship took its wings. Sean was adoring, charming, and playful around Justine, but when it was just Alicia and him, he was more relaxed, earnest. Of course he wanted to talk about Justine. Why does she act like a bitch sometimes? Does she really like him? Does she have another nigga in the Bronx? Alicia reassured him, told him that Justine really did like him. She just wanted to test his love for her, which wasn't entirely true, but Alicia liked saying it because it made her sound grown. They mostly talked about other things, though. Deep conversations like freight versus free will, God, heaven, and hell, the solar system, the apocalypse, natural disasters. He often mentioned his mother, who had died of leukemia just last year, or his father. He only said he hadn't cried when he hadn't he hadn't cried when he died. Alicia talked about her poor dead parents too, and they commiserated, joked about what their lives would have been like if their parents were still alive. She jokingly referred to him as her big brother, and in spite of her attraction to him, she really did feel a bit like they were brother and sister. Sometimes she pretended the basement was an orphanage and they were the last orphans left all each other ever had. Justine broke up with Sean two weeks after the summer ended and went back to the Bronx. I don't think a long distance relationship would work, was how she had put it. <laughs> I feel like she used me, Sean said to Alicia during one of his visits. Now I really do think she has somebody in the Bronx. Justine really did have a new man in the Bronx. That soon. But Alicia lied and told Sean otherwise. She wanted him to keep coming back and asking for new developments. And she wanted to position herself as, her only, as his only conduit to Justine. But as he started to give up on Justine and at the same time become more involved with school, music, and his friends, his visit slowly tapered off. At the same time, the police started hemming up the corner where Sean and his friends once occupied. So Sean and his friends relocated to another corner outside of Alicia's general five-block vicinity. It was entirely possible that even though they lived only six blocks away from each other, because so many other people lived within those same six blocks, they might not ever come across each other ever again. Thank you. Now it's time for Jacqueline Lazo. Is she here? Yay. Jacqueline is from Pittsburgh. She attended Northwestern University where she received her BA in English. In an attempt to support her writerly lifestyle, she also works as a publicist and an event planner. She can usually be found with her nose in a book at Downbeat Cafe. She lives in Los Feliz. I always want to say Los Feliz. <laughs> Los Feliz. Jacqueline. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. I guess there's not really a, how many of that to you? <laughs> and I think you left your phone here. Sorry to do administrative. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming. I am going to start out with a poem.
entitled Notice of Intention to Abandon. It appears that you have been negligent and vacated without so much as a note. I possess too much of you to sublet again. The frying pan you gave me for Christmas is still under the counter from when you insisted we turn off the gas for the summer months to save money. Your favorite sweatshirt, the blue college crew, remains stuffed behind my dresser from the last time you left. I muffled my screams with it yesterday so the neighbors wouldn't call the police. My face got stuck in the hole where the dog ate it, mistaking it for a chew toy. I also scream in the freezer while the disposal is running and in the shower with the radio on high. The day you moved in, you puked red all over my wheat colored couch. I now know the name of the bitter red berries you ate on my lawn. They're you berries, poisonous to some animals. Apparently you were immune. I put a down payment on the replacement chocolate leather couch you insisted went with the dog but you took the dog, and I hate that couch. I dropped the new collar I got Rex the day you left off at the Salvation Army. The next day, I bought it back for 50 cents, the bone-shaped tag still shiny with our new landline phone number etched in the metal. I didn't want any prank calls. When I got home, I yanked the dog tag off of its ring and slid it into my bookshelf between the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh and Carl Jung. I'm sending you this notice first class, priority with an envelope, postage prepaid, for you to write back. If you don't, I'll assume you move to ne Nebraska, Miami, Japan. I'll assume that you're breaking and entering someone else's heart, that a dog has a new name, that the dog has a new name, that your beard has filled out your face. I can't even write decent poetry anymore, breaking and entering someone else's heart. That was the best I could do with three revisions. I have to let, leave the house now to write or smoke until I can't help but laugh at all the herbs you let die on my balcony when I went out of town. The rosemary still weeps over the banister, its roots barely touching the dirt in the flower pot like anorexic limbs. So I've decided to sell your unclaimed goods in a yard sale out front by the yewberry tree. I'll sell your pixie CDs for pennies and your stolen license plates that you coveted will be free. The Xbox will earn me more, but I'll let the rugged surfer bargain me down, batting my eyes. Your bike will go last, the antique Schwinn that you tweaked every weekend, and I'll ride it around down to the boardwalk where I'll barter it for a ripped Van Halen tee and a used cowboy hat with a hole in the back. Um, the next poem is um, called Homage to the Earthworms. There are a lot of bugs in my, these are all from my thesis, and somehow bugs managed to make their way into my thesis, even though I really don't like bugs very much. Um, but I have a new appreciation for them based on my thesis, I guess. I am jealous of your aliases, dewworm, angleworm, nightcrawler. They make you sound productive as you string your body across the grass, laying pine nut shaped cocoons in the dirt. You are a hermaphroditic muscle slinky. Before even knowing you had five hearts, Darwin gave you praise. Quote, it may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly organized creatures, unquote. And you forgive so easily. You are even able to cut yourself in half, attach to another worm's bisection, and make a new. Isn't that what we as humans strive for? Regenerating our lost parts, slither until we learn to regrow. I find company with the earthworms. They are nature's subtle menders. Okay. I actually forgot to look at the time, but I have three more. This one um, is, I do some tutoring and um, I'm always, I teach a lot of uh, 
ESL students, and they either love the thesaurus or they have never heard of it. And so one of the students um, had never heard of it, and so there, this is just a tiny anecdote at the top that says, a thesaurus? A type of dinosaur? <laughs> kind of. A dinosaur with words. So that's sort of what inspired me to write this. And then there's um, also a quote from Sylvia Plath. I believe in not being Roger's trollop, parading words and tossing off bravado for an audience. So this is called On Using the Thesaurus. One, sometimes when I open you, it feels dirty, as if I just walked out of a bank heist smiling. The teller, ha the teller handed over a pocket full of bills, and I didn't even have to ask. Two, I remember when I first learned to read you, it was like reading Braille. I understood the words like raised dots, but their configuration meant nothing. Three, I want to call you out when I'm reading aloud. The preacher lectures, no, pontificates. That one there, I got him on the thesaurus black market. <laughs> Four, I go to church once a week now to confess. Dear Father, please forgive me for I have sinned. I use the thesaurus again and I am sorry. Five, when my tools, the words themselves, fail me, I swallow you whole. I can only rely on you so every so often because I begin to imagine I I can only rely on you so often before I begin to believe you are the artist doing the work I am meant to do. It is then that you rob me of my originality. 6. We are all word thieves whispering to ourselves sifting through your pages in the middle of the night. And I am also, actually, I'm going to read Circus of Creatures. My parents are here, and my, um, my father, who's right over there, is from New Jersey. Um, I can't remember which exit off the, the turnpike exactly. but um, <laughs> So this, is, this has a mention of New Jersey. So this is an honor of you, Daddy. Circus of Creatures. We drop the big top down and wait for the crowds to come. Lexadaisical beachgoers trounce across the hot asphalt parking lot to ride the plastic swans around the pond, shoot cardboard ducks with BB guns, winning fluorescent stuffed bears and rainbow unicorns. At six, my mother halts at the boardwalk's edge before stepping off the cement. Her black patent leather Mary Janes could have squished a caterpillar with one careless step. She reaches down, gently placing the fuzzy worm in her yellow coat pocket. She sighs. These visitors are unaware of the natives, the creatures who grow underground, who were here long before creaky Ferris wheels, electric go-kart crashes, the children's sticky, sweet pink fingers. She plucks a leaf off of a nearby tree and slips it into her pocket as well. She will leave the caterpillar in her neighbor's front yard in Margate, New Jersey, where the most exotic thing in town is the deserted elephant motel. From the room at the top of the elephant's hump, she can see beyond the boardwalk, past where we always drop the big top down straight to the ocean. And then uh, I have one last one. Um, this is called Walking the Cat. One, you should get him a lease, says Michael. The he is Samson, my cat. Michael knows I sometimes fantasize about what Samson's apartment would be like if he had one. <laughs> There'd be stockings full of kidnap everywhere and down comforters instead of carpeting. He would insist on a bed by the window with a view of the birds so he could mew at them as they pieced together their nests. Milk would run from the faucets, not water, and a large hand, godlike, would drop down from the ceiling to scratch the arch of his back. He would let the bills pile up outside his door, and he'd watch Meerkat Manor after his fifth nap of the day. <laughs> Two, I mean leash. Michael starts again, and walk him down Rodeo. 
I can't help myself. I envision delicate champagne-tinted Samson wearing a thin zebra-hide collar on the tightest rung around his neck. He would wear real hide. He has no tolerance for PETA. And, he, and me in my oversized Audrey Hepburn sunglasses, a sleek silk calf-length trench coat, and magenta peak-toed Louis Vuitton. We would slink past Barney's, Bendy, his leash loose in front of me as thin sales girls dashed toward the windows, toward the glass, arms piled high with hangerless clothes, their lithe bodies craning. Who would do that to a cat? They'd hiss. It's no different than carting a skirted poodle, poodle in a stroller or painting your Dalmatian's nails Russian red. Thank you. Next is Danielle Legner? Langner? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, her genre is nonfiction. And um, she's a nonfiction writer who currently lives in Redondo Beach, California. She writes for an online newspaper, freelances, and blogs at, are you ready for it? HTTP dot backslash backslash love and hate hermosa beach dot com. Welcome, Hello. Thank you, everyone, for being here, especially my mom, who's sitting in the back. Um, and this is a story from my thesis. It's called The Yankees, A Love Story. So, of course, I have to apologize to PT for having to sit through this. I understand if you want to wait in the hall. He's a Red Sox fan. So, here we go. October 20th, 2004, Game 7. New York Yankees and Boston Red Sox are in the playoffs. Winner goes to the World Series. The Red Sox haven't gone since 1918, but now the teams are tied. The Yanks were leading by three games, and I'm trying to wrap my head around how Boston was able to catch up. I am currently waitressing at a restaurant on the Strand in Hermosa Beach, California. My eyes are glued to the large flat screen television in the dining room while two men, one in his 40s and the other in his 60s, have their eyes glued on me, or rather my legs. The 60-year-old is with his wife and smiles at me every time she looks outside the large glass windows at the joggers passing by with their dogs. The 40-year-old knows my schedule and uses his 10-year-old son's love for milkshakes as an excuse to come in whenever I work, but the kid never orders milkshakes. Earlier, he said that if the Yankees lose, I should join them for dinner to make me feel better. It's my first attempt to watch a game since 2002. I try to focus on the television instead of the men. I am 19 and I haven't learned the stupidity involved with being a waitress and wearing a short white skirt. I have not learned that they are not tipping me well because I'm nice or that my manager hires mostly women for a reason. I do know that if my father was around to see this, he would make me quit and give every man in here a black eye. I am in denial that there is no one left to protect me. Two plates of liver and onions wobble in my nervous hands. I watch the game as I hold them steady. Red Sox Johnny Damon hits a grand slam and now the Yankees are losing significantly. It's late in the game. I don't know if they can come back from this. I slam the plates down in front of the customers without realizing it. Gravy splashes onto the table. I'm sorry, I say. I guess it's a bad idea to watch the Yankees lose while carrying hot plates. I force a laugh and the woman, a laugh, and the woman crosses her arms. The man smiles. He follows as I walk away to get more napkins. You're way too cute to be a Yankees fan, he says as I pick up a stack from the supply station. I squeeze, the, I squeeze the napkins in my hands, stammer something about how my father was a fan, then briskly walk away as my eyes welled up with tears. A party of six converses loudly, and I pass by just in time to hear an overweight man say, I hope the Yankees lose. He scoots his white plastic chair out and accidentally hits me. Oh, sorry, toots. Bring some more butter to the table, will you? I smile and nod, then turn around in time for the first tear to drop. As I'm walking back to the table with the butter, Yankee Rupin Sierra has been called out in second base. Boston has won 10-3, and they are going to the series. I walk into the dining room, and I'm suddenly surrounded by cheers. Am I in fucking Boston, I mutter? My cheeks are burning up. <laughs> my cheeks are burning up like I have a fever. <clears throat> I want my dad. He would be throwing things around the house and cursing loudly. If we were watching the game together, we'd be too upset to speak. My mom would hide in the kitchen from us both because anything she said would be wrong. 
I want to run home, sit on the couch next to him, and sulk for the rest of the night, but I know only my mother is there. She is in bed, and my father is gone. He is gone. The Yankees are dead, but they will come back next season. He is dead, and he will not. My jaw quivers. I run back into the kitchen, keel over, and start sobbing uncontrollably under the fluorescent lights. The cooks watch in silence. I quickly wipe tears off my cheeks, which are black from makeup. I can feel the mascara caked on my face, drying out my skin. The youngest cook, Juan, walks over to me. You okay, Daniela? he asks. I'm shaking my head over and over. It's not supposed to be like this. It wasn't supposed to happen, I say. Did the Yankees lose? he asks sympathetically. I'm sobbing too hard to answer. <laughs> Bill, the older, older Filipino cook, walks for, over from behind the stove and rubs my back. Next season, right? They'll come back. Why did that happen, I ask. Don't worry, next season, he says. I start shivering. I'm unable to speak. Another waitress walks into the kitchen and puts an arm on my shoulder. I'm sorry about the loss, she says. I can finish up here. You should go home. Fifteen years before, Dad paced back and forth on the brown carpet in our living room, a pinstriped hat with a Yankees logo over his salt and pepper hair. With the television on full blast, there was no room to hear anyone's voices in case someone dared to speak. My mom cooked in the kitchen to remove herself from the suspense. I sat on our velvet blue love seat directly behind my father, Yankee shirt on and sippy cup in hand. Up front and center, my four-year-old eyes watched him during game time, knowing he acted like a true fan should. From my toddler to teenage years, it was always the same. He nervously switched the thick Merlot in his wine glass, sipping only between innings. I'd rub my stomach to keep it from grumbling and cross my fingers that they would win. When the Yankees scored, he would clap four times and yell out, The Yanks! When they did not, he stayed silent, but his intensity could fill every seat in Yankee Stadium. I always wanted to be a part of it. I threw my hands up in the air when he did, and I mimicked his loud grunts when something went wrong. When a player struck out, he called him a dickhead and pointed at the screen accusingly. <laughs> I stood on the couch cushions barefoot, commanding Bernie Williams or Don Mattingly, whose names I heard most, to swing at that ball and run. Starting then, Dad explained the game in full detail, including each position, rule, and type of hit. What was that? He would ask me when Bernie hit one to left field and ran to second base. Double, I'd respond proudly. That's my girl. By the time I was six, I was fluent in Yankees baseball. My father gave me the following traits, a, ta a hot temper and a short fuse, a tendency to make impulsive decisions, naturally bushy eyebrows, a love for chocolate croissants and wine, an insistency to pursue a dream for a career path, even if it means being broke forever, me writing, he music, an obnoxiously loud clap, an even louder sneeze, the inability to fall asleep before midnight, and a borderline unhealthy obsession with the New York Yankees. During the beginning of the 2009 World Series, Yankees versus Phillies, I watched with my mother in our living room. I clapped four times loudly at shortstop Derek Jeter's base hit. When the Phillies hit one over the fence, I didn't answer my mother when she asked me if I wanted something to eat. When the inning was over, I picked up my glass of water, switched it around, took a sip, and yelled, Come on, Yanks. I looked at my mom and noticed her staring. What? I said. Nothing, she said. What? Tell me before the commercials are over. You're half my looks, but the rest of you is him. Daddy? Yes, you are definitely his daughter. From memory, I know this. In 1994, my parents and I were driving through a mall parking lot listening to the radio. The announcer confirmed the baseball strike. It was Yankee Don Mattingly's last chance to play in the series before retiring. I held my breath for my father's reaction. He was silent for the rest of the day. In 1995, the Yankees did not play in the World Series. In 1996, when the Yanks played the Atlanta Braves in the series, I was in New York with my mother for her great aunt's, for her aunt's anniversary party. Dad stayed in California. My parents and I celebrated the World Series wins from 97 to 2000 together. They drank wine and I had sparkling cider. The 2001 series was postponed because of September 11th. Sadly, the Yankees lost to the Diamondbacks. In 2002, the Yankees didn't make it to the playoffs. One month after the baseball season, my dad died. In 2003, I had a panic attack the first time I tried to watch a game. I stopped watching and didn't know what happened to that in that series until recently when I Googled. Yankees lost 2-4 to the Florida Marlins. I tried watching games again in 2004 until the Red Sox beat the Yankees. I was scared to pay attention again for four years. In 2008, I read Yankees news online and watched some game highlights, but never watched a full game. I started watching again in 2009. As I write this sentence, the Yanks... As I wrote this sentence, the Yanks were playing this series against the Philadelphia Phillies. I typed with my index and pinky fingers crossed. I was 11 in 1996, and I didn't understand why someone would schedule an anniversary party during the World Series, especially in New York when the Yankees were playing. 
My parents claim my father's decision to stay in Los Angeles while my mother and I went to New York had to do with our budget, but I theorized they were avoiding a fight about watching the game. I argued with my mom that it was very possible the Yanks would win that very night and it would be detrimental to my 11-year-old psyche if I didn't get to watch it happen. She explained that her aunt and uncle had been together for 50 years and their love was more important. I told her my love for baseball was more important. <laughs> she held out her frilly white dress with matching pink tights and told me to get ready. The party was held in a banquet room, part of a one-story building equipped with offices. Two hours in, after a toast when my relatives did the Macarena, I asked my mother if I could go exploring with my cousin Jonathan. She agreed as long as we stuck together. I'll be right back, I said to him as soon as we walked out of the banquet room. Where are you going, he asked. Bathroom. I walked down a long cement hall, listening for sounds of a television or radio baseball announcer. All the office doors were locked. As I made my way back to my cousin, I heard sounds coming from the front of the building, cheers that sounded like Yankees fans. I followed and came across a security desk. A man with a silver badge sat watching the game on a tiny, blurry black and white screen. Do you mind if I watch it, I asked. He was caught off guard. You want to watch TV? He cocked his head, studying my lanky stature and formal dress. I want to watch the Yankees, please. The man was silent at first, and then he smiled warmly and nodded. It's okay, you can watch the game too, he said. I said thank you and stood a few feet in back of him, my hands folded politely and my fingers crossed. My mom, worried when my cousin came back to the party alone, had come to find me with my uncle. Just as she was going to scold me, my uncle looked at the TV. Go, Danny. I can't believe you found the game. Man, that's awesome, he said in a strong New York accent. I told my mom I needed to watch it, I said. She shook her head. Your father's going to love this. Within ten minutes, half the party had joined us, anciently, anxiously clenching their fists for my team. The game was close, and the Yankees were up. We linked arms as it ended, with the Braves leaving the tying run on base and the Yankees winning. Everyone cheered loudly and kissed as if it were New Year's. When we left the party, I saw people had opened apartment windows in 20-story buildings. No no Noisemakers went off, and people yelled congratulations back and forth to one another. The streets were full of happy fans, warm from the high of victory despite 40-degree weather. My, my uncle skipped down the sidewalk yelling, woohoo, and high-fiving, smiling strangers. We have to call Daddy now, my mom said excitedly. I talked to him on a payphone. He was sitting in our living room alone, and I told him about the night. That's my girl, finding a TV in the middle of a stupid party. I wish you were here to see this. It's like New Year's, I said. I was part of it when I lived in New York. I was one of those people who made it like New Year's, he boasted. I asked him why he was alone and said it with friends. He had gone to his best buddy's house, he explained, but neither he nor his wife understood the importance of baseball. So I said later for you, and I went home during the seventh inning stretch, he said. I'm sorry. He sighed. You can't make people some understand something if they don't want to. I'd rather watch alone and feel the magic. Until this day, I've never been able to shake the image of him pacing back and forth right before the game's end, with only his Merlot and our small Pomeranian for company. It doesn't make sense to Los Angeles natives, especially locals in my hometown, Redondo Beach. People observe my behavior at local bars during games, the way I kneel on the bar stool to get, it close, to get as close to the television that hangs from the ceiling as possible. The bartender usually tells me to quiet down because I start yelling loudly whenever the Yankees do something good. Last season, a friend of mine cheered when the Phillies tied up the game, and I slammed silver around to the bar's count wooden countertop hard enough to silence everyone in the room. My father used to clap four times for good luck and refer to each player by his first name. I wear heels when my team plays, because they always win when I wear heels. I cross my fingers, because it brings them good luck when I do. When Hideki Matsui was on the team, I refused to watch when he was up to bat, because he struck out whenever I did. If I excused myself while he was at the plate, he was guaranteed to get on base. When I watch a game in public, people want to know why. Why are you a fan? My answers always vary because there is no simple way to answer. Why? A male acquaintance sitting on a bar stool next to me asked during the playoffs. My dad was a fan and Yankees was the third word I ever said, I responded, my eyes glued to the screen. Why? A married couple asked, both strangers who walked into the bar just in time to see me yell, to hear me yell dickhead at Derek Jeter for striking out. <laughs> My dad moved to Brooklyn from France when he was nine. He didn't know any English. Baseball was a language he understood and was drawn to it from the first time he walked by a store window and saw the Yankees playing a game. Listening to game, games helped him learn English, so naturally he taught me to be a fan, I responded. Why? A friend asked after I explained to her the reason I'm wearing heels. When my dad was a teenager, he waited in line for three hours to meet Mickey Mantle, who was one, who was one of the most important Yankees players of all time. He saw Mickey get impatient with a group of bratty children. They stuck their baseball gloves in his face for him to sign, and Mr. Mantle threw his bat on the floor and yelled, Oh, come on, man. 
That somehow humanized the Yankees for my dad. He told me that story all the time, which shows you how much he loved them. That makes me love them. I told her. She put a hand on my shoulder and said she understood. The first time my best friend asked me why, I told her a story. From 1996 until 2000, I knew so much about the Yankees that I thought of them as uncles, except for Derek Jeter, of course, who was and still is my fantasy boyfriend. I knew their batting averages, ages, nationalities, whether or not, and whether or not they were married or had kids. I cried in 1999 when second baseman Chuck, Chuck Knobloch developed problems throwing to first base. My dad and I agreed it was psychological, but Knobloch never recovered. I ran to the front of the bleachers yelling, I love you, at Derek Jeter once during batting practice. I was 15 and dressed in a navy blue top that showed my stomach. Jeter turned, smiled, and shook his head. I jumped in, up and down, exclaiming, he looked at me, he looked at me. My dad hung his head in humiliation. Between the two of us, my dad and I knew more about the Yankees than many people know about their family. Any more questions? Last season, last season, I was in my car on the 105 freeway on my way to my memoir class. It was 6 p.m. in the beginning of November 2009, but I was wearing open-toed stilettos with my lucky Yankees top and pink Yankees hat. If they won that night, it would be their 27th World Series. My dad was born on the 27th. It would be the first time they clinched a title since he died. As I sat in traffic, I kept my index and middle fingers crossed while I, while I held on to the steering wheel. The game was on the radio full blast. The announcer said that Matsui, Matsui was up to bat, so I turned it off. I arranged to have a friend text me to let me know how he did. I took deep breaths while checking my phone. The text came through three minutes later. It read, Matsui scored, Yankees are up. I clapped four times, rolled down my windows, and yelled, Matsui. <laughs> they were still winning when I arrived at school, my laptop in my bag. I turned off the car, ran to the building, and took the stairs instead of waiting for the elevator. I sat down, opened my computer, and streamed the game on the internet on silent. The score was 7-3. to three. Yankees. I could feel it. That night was going to be number 27. It was my day to workshop a piece, which happened to be about my dad and the Yankees. It was the bottom of the eighth inning, and my professor asked if, I'd like to, if I wanted to workshop then or have the class take a break first. I need some time, I said, tears welding up, my eyes welding up with tears, but still concentrating on Derek Jeter's up to bat. This whole thing is about to come together. Thank you. introduction, so I wanted to read it. <laughs> our, next, <laughs> our next reader is Kelly Moore, and her genre is fiction. Originally from Denver, Colorado, Kelly graduated from Dartmouth College in 2005 and moved to Los Angeles with, Los Angeles with dreams of becoming a less crazy-haired female Tim Burton. She wrote three screenplays, one of which was optioned by Turning Groove Pictures, and another of which placed in the prestigious Nickel Fellowship before deciding to attend the MPW program, where she transitioned from screenwriting into fiction. She is in the process of completing her first novel, The Strays, and after graduation is planning on moving to San Francisco to teach and continue writing. Please welcome Kelly Moore. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming, and thanks to all of my classmates and professors who have been so wonderful in the last couple years. And my parents are here. Um, this is the first time they've gotten to see me read, and uh, it is actually my mom's birthday, so you can all wish her happy birthday. <laughs> um, so I am reading um, a shortened version of the first chapter of my thesis novel called The Strays. My earliest memory is of a trip I took with my father in 1995 when I was five years old. He packed me up in a pair of pajamas and my puffy lavender coat and booked us both on the first flight to New York's JFK airport. The trip lasted four days and not once did we leave the terminal. As soon as we arrived in New York, we took the inner airport tram to the international arrivals gate. We rechecked ourselves and our belongings through security and staked out a long section of conjoined chairs not too far from the bathrooms and food court. Every night, my father would curl his long body into the fetal position, arranging his hips to fall in the middle of the center seat, which, he would, which would place his shoulders squarely on one of the adjacent chairs and his feet on the other. He would then open his arms wide, inviting me to curl my little body into the nook created by his slender chest. During the day, we were on the lookout. 
After brushing our teeth and sponging off our bodies in the men's bathroom, I was still young enough to go in with my father and not be questioned, we'd grab a cup of coffee, a hot chocolate, two cherry Dan and two cherry danishes at the little cafe a few gates down, and return to our post for a long day of scientific people watching. My father was long and wiry. His pants never quite came into acquaintance with his boat shoes, always leaving his sockless ankles exposed. His sweaters were far too wide for his thin rib cage, hanging little better on his lithe frame than they did on the cardboard cut up, cutouts at the store. As with many tall individuals who become self-conscious of their stature during adolescence, he sat with a pronounced slouch. When he was people-watching, he would lean forward over his thighs, bony elbows balancing precariously on bony knees. He'd rest his square jaw on his palms, allowing his spindly fingers to oscillate to and fro like nubile twigs in the winter wind. His arched back and draping, rusty orange sweater made him look like a giant piece of pizza. His unmoving rigidity made him seem like he was made of metal. So, in the way of bored only children, I turned into, uh, into the sign for my imaginary pizza restaurant and spent the days creating drawn-out intricate narratives about my business, stuffed dog employee, and plop posh global clientele. Every so often, my father's back would straighten and he'd reach under the seat and grasp my shoulder, effectively putting an order for a large pepperoni and candy corn on hold and gesture with his chin towards an owl-eyed owl individual blinking in the buzzing incandescent lights, maladjusted to the foreign chaos around them, and unsure where to go. They would clutch a small carry-on bag close to their body, likely containing all their worldly possessions they were able to salvage. What do you think of that one? My father would study their physical appearance, movements, and demeanor, looking for a specific combination that fit his formula for neediness, but he would always check with me before making his decision. It was my job to go up to the person and try to learn more. He's nervous but excited, I'd report back to my father, who would lean back in his seat and nod. That means he has plans. He has somewhere to stay, he would muse. I would shrug and climb onto his lap, knowing that he always got a little sad when he thought he found someone that, uh, that turned out not to need him. I would snuggle against him and ki he'd kiss my forehead. You smell like your mother. He'd rock me slowly and I'd pull at the pile on his sweater, wishing I remembered what she smelled like. She died three years before, when I was too young to form lasting memories. We finally found someone on the fourth day of our quest. It was just before lunchtime, and I was preparing for a rush on the day's special tuna fish pizza, when I felt the pressure of my father's fingers on my shoulder blade. What about him? He nodded towards a man with skin the color of my morning hot chocolate, wearing a threadbare striped t-shirt and a pair of black dress pants tied to his body with a piece of rope. He was blinking outside gate 43, a canvas messenger bag bundled over his left shoulder. I threw a piece of pizza on a plate and approached the man, careful not to spill any on the carpet as I skipped across the walkway. Would you care for some pink tuna fish pizza, sir? It's on the house. I hoisted the imaginary tray up as high as I could um, so he could smell the warm, salty blush baked into my pie. He studied for a moment, unsure how he was supposed to react, then reached down and took hold of the crust, cradling the slice with his other hand so that none of the toppings would drip. He took a long snip of it, sniff of it, closing his eyes and letting him take it to whatever seaside memory he had of childhood. He took a bite and chewed, hesitantly, unsure of the combination. As he switched the flavors between his molars, I got a better look at him. His arms and legs were thinner than my father's, the bones at each joint protruding, the muscles and ligaments connecting them almost concave. He looked like the skeleton I'd seen at the Natural History Museum my grandparents had taken me to the previous year except for his belly, which blossomed from his body like a newly inflated basketball. He pushed the remainder of the slice into his mouth all at once, chewing only enough to break it into smaller pieces, and swallowed it down. I could trace the chunks as they slithered down his esophagus and landed with an echo in his round belly. It was such an odd noise, I couldn't help myself. I reached up and laid my palm against his belly button. I was overwhelmed with feeling of emptiness and loneliness. This was the man my father wanted. He placed his hand gently over mine, thankful, I think, for some kind of human contact. I shook his hand and led him back across the terminal. Welcome to America. My father thrust out his hand to shake. Where are you from, friend? Somalia. The man placed his own hand into my father's, reluctantly. Come on then, Nadia. My father tussled my hair with his free hand. We have a plane to catch. He turned, and for the first time in four days, headed towards the exit, his head held high with a renowned, renewed sense of purpose. The man hesitated, like he was standing at a crossroads and didn't know which path to take. I gathered up my stuffed dog and lavender coat and took hold of his hand. I could feel his heart thumping through the skin of his palm. I squeezed his fingers tightly to let him know that it was okay, and together we followed after my father. Growing up, my family consisted of me, 
my father, a three-legged dog named Nikon, and over a dozen political refugees from every dictator-led, unstable, genocidal, civil war-torn corner of the globe. We called them the strays. My father began taking them in when I was too young to remember. Sometimes he said he did it because he had always wanted a big family, and after my mother died, this was the only way. Other times, he said all the violence and devastation he witnessed during Operation Desert Storm made it impossible for him not to do something. The truth was probably somewhere in between. I'm not sure my father himself knew entirely why he did it, but with the strays, he found a purpose. Our house was the last structure on High Street, a serpentine road that lived up to its name, winding through a few blocks of boutique shops and quaint Italian restaurants, before climbing its way past turn-of-the-century squares and tutors, all the way to the top of Olive Hill, and ending with abrupt 90-degree angles at a sharp 20-foot drop. There was no cul-de-sac, no turnaround, no guardrails to mark the dead end, just a few tendrils of wild grass lazily dangling onto the cement, differentiating, differentiating the end of civilization from the beginning of state-protected forest land. The house was large, with a master bedroom, children's nursery, nursery, wainscoted first floor office, and three additional bedrooms, but not large enough. When we pulled my father's forward into the driveway and, exhausted after a long flight home, pushed our way through the front door, the problem, which should have been immediately clear before our departure, made itself known. Four pairs of eyes, three human and one canine, stared back at us from the shabbying sofa. Three humans and one 150-pound canine that, when added to my father and myself, made six individuals who had filled out every inch of every room of our old Victorian with our personalities and belongings. There was nowhere to put our seventh occupant. My father tipped his, head, uh, tipped his forehead towards his right shoulder, the wrinkles in his eyebrows pressing in towards his skull. Everybody, this is Kente. He's from Somalia. He pulled back his shoulder blade, arching his spine, cracking vertebrae sore from the plane as he contemplated the situation. Tonight he'll sleep on the sofa in here. Tomorrow we'll all begin work on a new addition to the house to give him his own space. My father's disciples sprung into action. Yevgeny, a Romanian man with ghostly white skin and slick brown hair, methodically pulled a sheet, blanket, and extra pillow from the linen closet, piling them in a neat pyramid on the sofa. Sharif, a stout, muscular Algerian, gave Kente a quick tour of the house, pointing out the kitchen, bathrooms, bedrooms, and den in soft Arabic tones. Tatiana, a stern Georgian woman with, uh, with dark, scowling features and ample bosoms, bustled herself into the kitchen and started up the stove, pu pulling Tupperware containers out of the refrigerator with abandon. She filled up a large TV tray with eclectic dishes of spiced yogurt and cucumbers, pickled herring, thick-cut fried potatoes, and turkey meatloaf. Her chubby thighs swished together in her rib tights as she carefully balanced the tray and transported it into the living room. The second the food hit the mahogany coffee table, Kente pounced upon it. He lifted the china bowl to his lips and poured, poured the yogurt and cucumber down his gullet like it was a funnel. When he was done, he licked the bowl and placed it back on the tray. I vaguely remembered there being a spoon with the dish, but when Kente finished, it had disappeared. I convinced myself that I must have imagined it there, because there was no way somebody could have swallowed up a whole piece of 19th century Pemberton silver. He tackled the meatloaf and potatoes next, shoveling fist-sized mounds into his mouth at Audubon speeds. Finally, he lifted the platter of herring, taking each fish and sliding it directly down his throat like a sword swallower's bag of tricks. When he had finished all 16 of them, I counted as he ate, fascinated by his voracious appetite. He daintily placed the plate back on the tray and smiled sheepishly at the rest of us. Tatiana and Sharif stared back with jaws unhinged. Even Yevgeny, who rarely let a smile blow past his lips, gaped with his eyebrows pinned up. As I studied their astonished faces, I realized that my own mouth had fallen open, just like the characters in my favorite cartoons. Only my father remained oblivious, flipping through the pile of mail that accumulated under the Tiffany lamp since our departure. I think I'd like to go to sleep now, if you don't mind. Kente pulled his shoulders close together, ducking into his shell. Yeah, yeah, of course. Tatiana scooped up the platter and hurried back into the kitchen. Shalom. Sharif patted Kente gingerly on the shoulder and nodded his good night to the rest of us. Yevgeny, stoic and silent as always, bowed his head and floated out of the room as well. Good night, Kente. Sleep well and, again, welcome. My father shoveled the pile of mail under his arm and flipped the light switch. Don't stay up too late, Nadia. We've got a big day tomorrow, he called back over his shoulder. I remained seated under the end table, still in the pajamas from my trip, my knees bowing outwards like a frog's. Kente shifted his body, pulling the blanket up under his chin and pushing his forehead back into the sofa. As he settled, I inched closer until my nose rested on the sofa cushion nearest his head. His stomach let out a loud growl, like a large man who hadn't eaten all day, sending vibrations through the damp skin stuffing. 
He smelled like a mid-afternoon on a hot beach, hot, sandy, and a little burned. As I pushed my face closer, I realized his body actually radiated heat, like a campfire. I cautiously lifted my in index finger up to the back of his neck. I restrained myself from actually touching him, but I held my fingers behind his ear and stroked the air gently, like one would pet a newborn kitten. His stomach growled again, echoing off the crown molding like a lion's roar ricocheting through the Serengeti. He flipped his body over, taking my, me by surprise. I was just barely able to pull my fingers out of the way and duck my head below his eye line. Your pizza was the best thing I ate all day, he whispered. Got any more? I peeped my eyes back up over the edge of the cushion and found him looking back at me. I nodded. We locked eyes in a staring contest. His irises were so dark I couldn't tell them apart from his pupils in the dim light. His eyelashes were short but thick, and his eye sockets deep-set and sad-looking. He was younger than I had originally thought, no more than twenty years old. I wondered how someone so young could have such old man eyes. Well? He raised one eyebrow. I crawled back under my end table and got to work. I'm out of tuna fish. Do you like deviled eggs? Literally none. I like everything. He stretched the last word out like taffy, so I threw some of that on the pizza as well. I hummed as I piled the hot pie, uh, pulled the hot pie out of the oven and pushed it towards him. He sat up, lifting the whole pizza at once, folding it in half and biting into it, the taffy and cheese forming gooey strands as he took each bite of the imaginary pie. When he finished, he licked each of his fingers at the, and then the corner of his mouth and burped softly. Thanks, little Inan. I'm going to go to sleep now. He settled his head back onto the pillow and shut his eyes tight. Good night, Kente, I whispered. He smiled back at me, and I scampered out of the room and up the stairs to my own bedroom, happy with my new housemate and with four days' worth of stories to tell the moon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce our last reader, uh, Brian McGacken, who you all heard, I think, got a book deal earlier today, so congratulations. Um, he writes poetry, and uh, his bio is as follows. Brian mainly, mainly writes poetry and comic books. He's also the poetry editor of the Southern California Review, USC's biannual literary journal. He has no idea what he's going to do after graduation, but if you have any suggestions, make sure to write them on the memo line of the pity checks you'll hopefully send them. <laughs> so, Brian McGaffin. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be quick because we're cutting into reception time, and I really like receptions. So, um, if any of you have ever been to New Jersey, Philadelphia, or northern Delaware, um, you know that Wawa is the greatest convenience store in the history of the universe. Uh, this first poem is called Stopping by Wawa on a Snowy Evening. <laughs> is Wawa open? Yes or no? We need to stop if it's not closed, to stock up for the party. Shit, but Wawa doesn't sell beer, though. I'm such an ass, I must admit, I'd completely forgotten it. Convenience stores don't sell booze here. Now how the hell will we get lit? We've only got two racks of beer and one bottle of Everclear. That's just enough for maybe three or four of us. It would appear that some of us will have to be spending the night alcohol-free. I guess I'll drink lemonade tea. I guess I'll drink lemonade tea. <laughs> Um, this one's called God Save the Queen. To Her Majesty Elizabeth II, by the grace of God, of Great Britain, Ireland, Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Barbados, Belize, Canada, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Christopher and Nevis, St. Lucia, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, Tuvalu, Queen, Defender of the Faith, Duchess of Edinburgh, Countess of Marioneth, Baroness Greenwich, Duke of Lancaster, Lord of Man, Duke of Normandy, Sovereign of the Most Honorable Order of the Bath, Sovereign of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Sovereign of the Most Illustrious Order of St. Patrick, Sovereign of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, Sovereign of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, Sovereign of the Distinguished Service Order, Sovereign of the Imperial Service Order, Sovereign of the Most Exalted Order of the Star of India, Sovereign of the Most Eminent Order of the Indian Empire, 
Empire, sovereign of the Order of British India, sovereign of the Indian Order of Merit, sovereign of the Order of Burma, sovereign of the Royal Order of Victoria and Albert, sovereign of the Royal Family Order of King Edward VII, sovereign of the Order of Mercy, sovereign of the Order of Merit, sovereign of the Order of Companions of Honor, sovereign of the Royal Victorian Order, sovereign of the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, sovereign of the Order of Canada, sovereign of the Order of Australia, sovereign of the Order of New Zealand, sovereign of the Order of Barbados, sovereign of the Order of Valor, sovereign of the Order of Military Merit, sovereign of the Order of Merit of the Police Forces, Sovereign of the Queen's Service Order, Sovereign of the New Zealand Order of Merit, Sovereign of the Order of St. Andrew, Sovereign of the Order of Lagahu, Sovereign of the Order of the Star of Melanesia, Supreme Governor of the Church of England, Paramount Chief of Fiji. I heretofore wish to extend a most glorious and happy birthday <laughs> on the occasion of the celebration of the fourscore and fourth anniversary of the day of your birth to Prince Albert, Duke of York, later George the Sixth of etc., King, etc., and his wife, Elizabeth, later the Queen, later still the Queen Mother, who lived an exceptionally long life, this the 21st day of April, being also the 111st day of the year, in the year of our Lord, MMX. Furthermore, I would like to say you rock, and I think you're way cooler than that little Nancy boy, Charles, so hopefully you live a wicked long time, so William can just take the crown right from you. Yours, most assuredly, B.P. McGacken, future Knight Grand Cross of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. Please. <laughs> um, this one is called uh, Switching Lanes While Removing a Sweatshirt. <laughs> Unintentionally, of course, but not, in truth, entirely unexpected. Like sneezing at 70 miles per hour, panic sets in just after the point where one can no longer break the commitment. You're fairly certain you know how much room you've got in front, but the car next to you doesn't know that you've lost control, that you're not going to turn when the highway does, because a seatbelt is strapping fabric over your head. So one of you will keep driving onward, while the other drifts right with traffic. Neither can now veer away. Um, is this called How to Be a Superhero? Be too skinny for the army. Don't avoid cosmic rays. Go to high school. Field trip's optional. Be Canadian. Be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Find a superhero, preferably dying. Take their ring, mantle, cowl. Sign up for government testing. Don't sign up for government testing. <laughs> Have a friend who doesn't avoid cosmic rays. Hunt vampires. Wait for a parent, uncle, spouse to die. Feel bad. <laughs> Be abducted by extratemporal guardians of some kind. Grow up in a mystical city, on a magical mountain, or somewhere in the future. Jump out a second story window into a vat of toxic chemicals. Have a boyfriend who doesn't avoid cosmic rays. Hit puberty, accidentally blow something up, impale someone, creep out foster parents with newly discovered mutant abilities, feel bad. Turn into some kind of plant, deliberately or accidentally. Step in the path of radioactive substances as they tumble from a moving vehicle. Control the weather. Scout locations for a massive world devouring cosmic entity to satisfy his hunger, feel bad. Shoot vaguely defined energy beams from arbitrary body parts, though preferably the hands or eyes. Be a duck. Talk to a white horseman alien, preferably dying, take his powers. Have a sister who has a boyfriend who doesn't avoid cosmic rays. Be born to, raised by, mind controlled by supervillains, feel bad. Build a suit of armor, technological or other. Know of a sibling, cousin, parent, significant other, random acquaintance, complete stranger that is a superhero. Become superhero with similar name. Be incredibly wealthy. Choose any or all of the above. <laughs> um, this one is called the Gutenberg Bible. It's, very, uh, it's a very prestigi prestigious item if you've never heard of it. Um, in the beginning, God created heaven and Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> and God saw that it was good. So he let Steve take care of the rest. And Steve said, let there be light. And there was light. And Steve said, let there be police academies. And there were six sequels. <laughs> and then, in a moment of true genius, Steve said, let there be Tom Selleck and Ted Danson. And there were three men and a baby. <laughs> and Steve saw that it was good. It was so, so good. 
And God was pleased, and all was right with the world. But then Steve said, let there be high spirits, and let there be it takes two. And finally, for some strange reason, let there be Zeus and Roxanne, about a dog and a dolphin who becomes best friends. Wouldn't that be so cool, guys, God, anybody? <laughs> and it was not good. It was not good at all. <laughs> I know, because I saw it in theaters when I was 11. Even then I knew it sucked. So then Steve said, let there be dancing with the stars. But by that point, God had stopped listening long, long ago, and Steve was on his own. Maybe he should have considered a job in publishing. I hear Gutenberg is a good name for that. <laughs> oh, I will end. <laughs> I will end on a on a, a sequence, a sequence, a, a series of poems, um, in five parts, entitled Thursday. The first part is called Anticipation. I am not an alcoholic. At least I'm pretty sure. Though my mother tends to leave the porch light on more and more these days. Well, when I'm there anyway. But some bar nights, or parties, maybe Labor Day barbecues, parade themselves through my mind weeks ahead of time, like prom or the first day of college. I get Disney World excited for the weekend's first Guinness, sometimes, when it's been a while, or if I've had a rough hour. <laughs> Two, the buzz. Ah, oh, it goes down rough, but oh Christ, that's good. I never thought that standing could feel so much like a massage. One more shot real quick. Huh? Oh, hey, my man, what's up? How's it been, man? Good? Yeah? Good? No, no, same shit, just hanging out. You know, you know how it is. Hold up. What? Who is this? Wait, I can't... Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll buzz you in. See ya. Hey, sorry. Uh, here, drink this. Wow, that is fantastic. This is great. I had no, many, no idea so many people would show. Part three, drunk. <laughs> Who the fuck are these people? <laughs> beer! Oh man, you guys read my minds. Who are you, like the beer fairy? That's, that's so great, thanks for coming. Seriously though, who are you? <laughs> no way, yeah, 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 okay. I fucking love that rat bastard. Here, throw me one of them beers. Oh, shit, my bad. Here, just use that towel there. Whose turn is it? Wait, when the fuck did that happen? So play again. Play again. Hold up, whose water is this? Hell no, H2O. Let's play. Part four. The sleep. Eight plus four plus I think three equals... I can't count that high. How many cups of water that is that? How many cups? Just pour. Can we go to bed now? No, I wasn't. I was talking to God. The ceiling is being mean when I close my eyes, so I'm just going to tell him God on him. <laughs> what? I, that's not a wall. No, it's not. It's... Oh, shit. <laughs> I thought the desk was tired. <laughs> Yeah, no, wait, no, bed is not fun. Oh, I'm so fucked up right now. Part five, morning. Never again. <laughs> Thank you.